Good afternoon. Uh, this is a joint meeting of the Planning and Land Use Management Committee and the Transportation Committee. We have uh, one item on the agenda on the Planning and Land Use Management Committee. Uh, myself, Council Chair Weizar is present, Councilmember Marquise Harris Dawson, Councilmember Mitch Englander, and Councilmember Felipe Fuentes. I'd like to call this meeting to order and call upon the Chair of the Transportation Committee, uh, Councilmember Bonin. Good afternoon. Uh, pleased to say we have a full house with the newly constituted Transportation Committee. Uh, Ms. Nuri Martinez, Mr. Paul Koretz, Mr. David Rue. And uh, as I was just saying, Mr. Wiesar gets two votes today because he gets to vote on each committee because he's a new member of the Transportation Committee. So uh, glad to see such a, a robust presence here today. This is actually a, a pretty big day. This is a groundbreaking document in front of us. Uh, that is actually has the capability and the likelihood really of changing the, the paradigm here in Los Angeles in terms of transportation and planning. Uh, the document that is in front of us presented by planning and transportation is, in my opinion, a smart one, a thoughtful one, and a progressive one. And it's also a forward-looking one. There's not a person in Los Angeles who doesn't complain about traffic. There's not a person in Los Angeles who isn't frustrated about traffic about gridlock and the way our city has been ill-designed in such a way that it forces us to, to be stuck and sometimes prisoners in our own neighborhoods. There are three things that we know uh, will never solve the traffic problem. We can't widen our way out of it. We can't keep saying no to things because that doesn't cure or reduce traffic. And we can't fold our arms and blink like on I Dream of Genie. That also doesn't make traffic go away. But creating more choices and coming up with a, a smart plan that increases mobility for people actually can impact traffic. And this is a plan that I think goes a very long way towards doing that. Right now here in Los Angeles, about 47% of the trips in our city are made within a radius of three miles. That's a walkable distance, that's a bikeable distance. But 84% of those trips are made by car. Something's wrong with that equation. That's an equation, that's a recipe for the traffic gridlock we live in. People don't refuse to walk or refuse to bike because they don't want to, at least not many of them. They do it because it's not safe, it's not convenient, and there's not an integrated network to get around. And the plan we have before us today is one that begins to change that and gives us an integrated network, something that puts a premium on safety something that puts a premium on smart coordination around the city, something that puts a premium on social equity by giving people who can't afford a car a way to get around the city of Los Angeles. This is a really important document. We're going to have lots of, of questions, plenty of public comments. There's a stack of speaker cards about a half inch thick here. Uh, but this is an important way of doing something different here in the city of Los Angeles. I said this document is forward thinking. And the way it's forward thinking is it acknowledges that the public here in Los Angeles is ahead of where the city government is. Right now we have a new generation, I'd estimate folks 35 and under, who aren't putting a premium on having a car, who want to live a car light or a car free lifestyle, who are seeking neighborhoods that are self-contained where they can live, work and play, where they don't have to choose an automobile. At the same time we have a rapidly aging population where the numbers of people who are going to be retirement age or older are going to be skyrocketing in the next few years. They don't want to drive as much. They want to stay and they want to be able to live and work and they want to age in place. And this is a document that acknowledges those trends and begins to set the city on a course of integrating those in how we plan and how we do mobility here in Los Angeles. For too long we've been a city that has been auto-centric, addicted to the single occupancy vehicle and we're going to be stuck in gridlock until we realize that people need a way to get on the bus, to get on shuttles, to get on the trains, above or below ground, to walk, and to bicycle. And this is a smart document that, that prioritizes different networks for walking, for cycling, and for all those other modes of transit. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, before we call the staff up here, I do want to commend the Planning Department and the Transportation Department for their credible work on this document. And as Chairman Bonin stated, it is forward thinking, it is progressive, and as been mentioned that for too long the city of Los Angeles has prioritized cars 
over other means of transportation. And this uh, document uh, intends to uh, incorporate the concept of complete streets, which looks to multi-modes of transportation, but at the same time recognizing that it's not for every street. And that's why through its uh, carefully tailored, tailored networks, it hopes to find that balance of where it is appropriate and where it is not. So I want to thank the departments for their incredible work for uh, the outreach and uh, for getting us to this point. Uh, I do think just as we uh, incorporated the health element of our general plan not too long ago, which was a huge step for the city in terms of recognizing the importance of health indicators in how the city moves forward in planning for the city, uh, this too is taking a, a very important step forward uh, that would have lasting effects for the future of the city. So what we're about to do here is uh, um, uh, very important for not only the immediate uh, uh, years before us, but for uh, a long time. So I want to thank the departments again for their work. And with that, uh, we'll call up the departments to uh, provide a presentation on the mobility plan. Thank you. Good afternoon once again. Ken Bernstein with the Department of City Planning, changing hats a bit as a, a principal city planner overseeing our policy planning and historic resources division. And we are very pleased to be before you today bringing you this important package, Mobility Plan 2035. This is the culmination of about four years of uh, hard work and significant public engagement throughout the city. We wanted to start by just quickly giving you a sense of what this plan is and how it fits in with our city's planning framework. Uh, the mobility plan is not just a freestanding transportation plan for the city. It is actually going to become part of the city's general plan. Our general plan, of course, is our guiding document, our guiding vision uh, for our city. And the general plan provides the foundation for all of our planning decisions in the city. It provides direction not only for the work of our department, but for all city agencies. And the mobility plan, as an element of the general plan, has broad policy goals, uh, has uh, broad goals and policies and specific implementation programs that will create a new policy framework for the city for mobility that then also will be carried out in all of our city's plans, including our 35 community plans. Mobility Plan 2035 is actually our first comprehensive update of our transportation and mobility policy since the 1990s. It will replace the transportation element of the general plan that was adopted in 1999, but was a product of several years of work throughout the mid-1990s. So it's really been almost 20 years since we revisited our mobility policies. And Los Angeles is a city that has changed very dramatically, obviously, in the last uh, 20 years. And our thinking about mobility has also changed very dramatically during that time. Most importantly, we've made a commitment, uh, the, really the, the largest commitment of any city, to make a significant local investment in transit infrastructure. And as Councilmember Bonin alluded to, in many ways, our citywide policy framework hasn't caught up to both that uh, commitment to infrastructure and new ways of thinking about mobility throughout the city at a grassroots level. And so this plan is about creating a new policy foundation to complement and further capitalize on that transit investment and all of the activity that's taking place around mobility throughout the city. Just to be clear, this plan does represent a policy shift for the city. Uh, it represents a recognition, and Councilmember Bonin alluded to this already, that we can no longer build our way out of our traffic problems in Los Angeles. We can no longer create enough new capacity through street widenings or other improvements to allow Angelinos to move freely around the region. We can instead best enhance mobility by taking cars off the road, by reducing vehicle trips and reducing vehicle miles traveled. And if we're able to fully build out the improvements that are envisioned in Mobility Plan 2035, uh, our EIR indicated it would take uh, 219,000 trips off the road daily and result in 1.7 million uh, vehicle mi fewer vehicle miles traveled uh, every day. And the plan is also a policy shift in putting safety first. Um, literally, that is the first policy goal of this plan, and it puts access and choice front and center. But even if we hadn't made these policy commitments on our own, state law now actually requires that we go in this direction. The state has passed the Complete Streets Act, Complete Streets Act uh, in 2008, which states that when local governments do 
uh, update uh, circulation elements of their general plan, the plan must incorporate policies to promote complete streets, to make our streets work for everyone, not only people who drive, but also people who walk, people who bike, and people who take transit. And the plan is about also making smart investments. All too often as a city, we've had a rather piecemeal or disjointed approach to coordinating transportation improvements or street improvements. And the central idea of this plan is to give us a much more coordinated and comprehensive approach to make future investments. So when we do have opportunities, whether it's metro call for projects or special grant opportunities that are out there, uh, we don't have just a project here, another project over there, but we have a concentrated and prioritized set of public investments in integrated networks uh, to build out this system as a whole and to look at projects that will provide the most benefits for the greatest number of users. A far-reaching comprehensive plan such as this one is truly a team effort, and I want to recognize the outstanding work of our Department of City Planning team, led by Claire Bowen, our senior city planner, and our project manager, Mai La. I also want to recognize Jane Choi, who was our project manager uh, for uh, this plan in its first two years, as well as our systems and GIS division, often the unsung heroes of our department, the folks who do invaluable work for us on data, mapping, and graphics, without whom this plan could not have come forward. And this has been a true partnership with our sister city agencies. We want to thank the public works staff, which works so closely with us on many components of this plan, including new street standards and classifications, particularly Bureau of Engineering staff. They are represented here today. And above all, this has been a tremendous collaboration between Department of City Planning and LADOT, and we are very honored to be joined today by LADOT staff, uh, led by their general manager, Salida Reynolds, and Jay Kim from LADOT. And I turn it over now to uh, Salida, Claire, and Jay. Thank you very much, Ken and Claire, both for your leadership, and thank you for the opportunity to come before you today um, and talk about this amazing uh, opportunity for the city to change the way that it does business. Our streets are an invaluable public asset, and for too long, the way that we've measured our success is how fast and how wide. And that is a huge missed opportunity. When we talk about our streets, we're talking about public health. We're talking about economic development. We're talking about resilience. And we're talking about quality of life. We're talking about community happiness. Places, neighborhoods that are bikeable and walkable, that have places to gather and form strong connections in neighborhoods, build strong communities, which builds a strong city. For a long time, we haven't had sort of a, a, a guiding document that viewed the streets in this way. If you owned a business and didn't change the way that you dealt with an asset for 50 years, you wouldn't be in business anymore. So the city has to take up the challenge of thinking about the tremendous opportunities that our streets represent and the things that we are missing by keeping the same way of doing business as we have for the last 50 years. The second thing about this plan that is significant is its focus on safety. Every year, a little over 200 people uh, die in the city of Los Angeles just trying to get around town. About half of those are people biking and walking, the most vulnerable users on the street. And about half of those are older adults, people over 65. Um, a, a, a majority of those injuries and crashes happens on just 6% of our city streets. And when you look at where those streets are, a full half of them are in communities that are low income and they're impacted by other negative health outcomes and negative environmental outcomes. There are inherent inequities about where people are being injured and killed getting around town because they don't have another choice um, or because they've chosen to bike and walk. Um, this plan puts safety as our compass, as our North Star. And I do want to emphasize that just because you draw a line on a map or erase a line from a map doesn't change the fact that people will bike, walk, take transit, and drive there. And we have an obligation to deal with the public health crisis on our streets and to design places that are safe and protect the most vulnerable among us who are just trying to get around town. I also want to um, thank and encourage the adoption of a new playbook for design. Many of the street design standards that we use have not been updated since the 70s. So in routine work, you know, the engineer in their cube, uh, the planner at her desk, making decisions on a daily basis bound to design standards that are woefully out of date. 
this plan opens the door for us to adopt uh, best-in-class design standards so that those routine decisions result in positive outcomes. Um, and last, I want to point out that um, this plan takes advantage of Los Angeles's tremendous network of streets. Complete streets doesn't mean every mode wins on every street. This plan is a balanced approach um, that emphasizes and gives clear direction for which mode should take priority on which street. And, and that's critical uh, in when we think about how to leverage outside dollars. So bringing this plan to cap and trade funding, thinking about it in terms of the upcoming uh, Measure R opportunity, it is critical for Los Angeles to articulate its priorities so that we can get in line for uh, the dollars that are, are, we have the potential to capture and bring to the city. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Claire. Good afternoon. Claire Bowen, Senior City Planner with City Planning Department. The mobility plan, as Ken mentioned, is a long-range policy document and as a part of the city's general plan establishes goals and objectives as a foundation upon which to measure future transportation changes and establishes policies and programs that the city can use as a basis for future decision making and to direct future funding and capital improvement decisions. This plan has been almost four years in the making and to ensure that we reached as broad and diverse a range of people as possible, we used a variety of methods, both traditional and innovative. The outreach included an online town hall and project website, la2b.org. These electronic communication tools allowed us to reach a younger and diverse population than we might typically encounter through traditional strategies. But we also know there is tremendous benefit from in-person meetings. So we conducted over 100 meetings with community groups and organizations across the city. We also engaged with the many city departments that are involved with designing, engineering, and maintaining city streets, along with transit organizations that provide a range of transportation options. Our task force included over 50 groups that represent business and neighborhood concerns, as well as active transportation issues and transit operations. We held seven regional planning forums in diverse geographic locations. Each forum included multilingual staff in a range of languages particular to that geography, and advertisement for these events was conducted across media platforms, including the installation of bus shelter ads throughout the city. This plan represents the thoughts of many, many different voices that we heard from over the past four years. What we heard repeatedly was the need for safer streets, for all modes and all ages, for more comprehensive approaches to problems, and for an expanded range of solutions to assist people with both local and regional trips. The mobility plan sets up a foundation to plan for multiple travel modes. The plan offers an expanded set of solutions to transportation challenges because we can no longer afford to think of one solution to solve complex issues. We need to manage our roadways more efficiently and provide useful alternatives for a variety of trips. All of the components of a transportation system need to work together to see any real effect. Whether it is planning for people involved in goods movement or who ride the train or bus or drive a vehicle or a person who bicycles, walks, or rolls, this plan provides an assembly of solutions and lays out a strategy for multimodal transportation investments that will guide the city to a seamless transportation system that is flexible and functional for all users. LA streets are one of the most visible areas of public investment and maintenance. We already have mechanisms and funding to address things like pavement maintenance and aging infrastructure, so that in many instances, it is really about making the most of the investments we are already programming and ensuring that the designs meet as many objectives as possible when we reconstruct the public right-of-way. LA's mobility future is directly linked to our economic competitiveness. At the regional level, we have benefited, benefited greatly from the transit investments that have been made over the past 25 years. This plan extends those regional connections into every one of LA's neighborhoods through mobility hubs and enhanced networks to ensure that the benefits of access are provided throughout the city and not just to the neighborhoods with a rail station. The transit, bicycle, neighborhood, and vehicle enhanced networks provide a long-term holistic vision of streets connected by various modes. These concept networks allow the city to lay a comprehensive framework for an integrated multimodal future. The networks create opportunity to discuss a number of possible transportation solutions, but they do not dictate design outcomes. The networks can provide a platform for a balanced approach to design solutions that complement each other. Further studies, design considerations, environmental analysis, and stakeholder engagement will be required through, 
before any of the network segments can be realized. This additional work provides the city with the opportunity to explore alternative corridors and a variety of design solutions as long as the integrity of a comprehensive kinetic network is maintained. The plan acknowledges and welcomes that kind of flexibility. In this way, the plan responds to behaviors, needs, and shifts that may, that may adjust over the next 20 plus years. We know that shifting even a small percentage of people to change their transportation behaviors can have a major impact on our roadways. During the 1984 Olympic Games, it took only a 5% shift in travel patterns to result in a major change to traffic for that special event. This plan supports a host of policies, programs, and active transportation improvements that together will result in those small choice differences that can add up to major reductions in overall driving trips and miles traveled. Without the plan, we can expect to continue to endure the same traffic challenges that we encounter today. This plan is not a land use plan, nor does it induce increased development or growth. Instead, the plan responds to the transportation challenges faced by today's current population while responding to and preparing for the anticipated future growth that will occur with, with strategies that expand our ability to move more people within the existing roadways. For example, by expanding the reach of a reliable and frequent transit system beyond just the rail network, we can expand the number of people who have easy access to transit while also increasing the number of people that can move through a corridor within a given time frame. It is time for a new plan, a plan that acknowledges that importance of viewing improvements first through a safety lens and not just about moving lots of vehicles really fast. It's time to shift our approach. 500 people or more, I guess this is at 200, are killed in traffic collisions each year on our city streets. If we do not shift our approach, we cannot expect the statistic to change. It is also a plan that focuses on quality infrastructure investments across all modes, whether it's goods movement or passenger vehicles, transit, bicycling, or walking. It is a plan that facilitates increased access to multiple transportation options. It is a plan that elevates the use of data-driven analysis to ensure that future funding allocations are distributed equitably. It is a plan that encourages collective decision making and the breaking down of silos. And lastly, it is a plan that values the environment and looks to leverage capital improvements to achieve multiple environmental objectives, whether it's cleaner air, increased stormwater, or reduced reliance on natural resources. We expect that over the next 20 years, the city's transportation system will continue to evolve in response to changing technology and personal behaviors, energy costs, environmental concerns, and economic constraints and opportunities. This plan sets the foundation for these dynamic changes, not by setting forth absolutes, but by setting aspirational goals and objectives that we can strive to achieve, establishing policies to guide development and funding decisions, and a flexible range of programs to implement educational, equitable, economic, and engineering changes in how we design, operate, and maintain our city streets, not just as places to move cars, but as places to gather and linger and walk, roll, and ride. In closing, I want to thank all of your commitment to this plan and this fiscal, year's, this fiscal year's budget. As a result, the city planning mobility team of two staff is, growing to grow, is going to grow to five in the next few months. This means that planning will have the staff to pl in place to work with you and our colleagues in DOT and public works, along with the business community, transit agencies, nonprofit organizations, and community members to continue this dialogue and start outlining project options. We're excited about helping position the city as a leader in innovative multimodal transportation solutions. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Jay Kim from uh, LADOT. First, I would like to uh, thank and acknowledge Thomas Carranza and other key members of LADOT staff who have contributed greatly to this uh, document. As it was alluded to earlier, <clears throat> there's been a tectonic shift in the way that we think about urban mobility. It is no longer about just moving cars, but uh, rather about moving people around <clears throat> in a uh, safe and efficient manner. As we make one of the largest public transit infrastructure investment in the country through Measure R, this is a great opportunity for the city <clears throat> to take a broader view beyond the cars and repurpose the city system in a complementary manner to create improved mobility options, healthy communities, great public spaces, and safe streets. As such, the Mobility Plan 2035 is not only a policy document, but it includes a complete street design guide with new street standards as an implementation tool that will embed complete street concepts into actual engineering manuals to ensure that future street projects are designed, approved, and implemented with all users in mind. 
the Complete Street Design Guide was developed in close collaboration with uh, City Planning, DOT, and Public Works. This document really is an embodiment and affirmation of our current policies with additional ideas to make lasting changes. The, the plan encapsulates innovative transportation ideas into a single policy document with built-in mechanisms to translate those policies into actionable programs. In summary, this plan is about balanced transportation network, sustainable transportation, connected mobility, multimodal options, and safe and livable streets for all users. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, I'd want to I'd ask if any of the committee members have any questions for discussion. We also have about an hour's worth of uh, public comment, uh, given all the cards we have. So I uh, don't know if, uh, Mr. Bonin, it's your desire to raise questions now or discussion or wait till after public comment or whatever. Uh, I've any questions or comments? We just open. Want to do come in public comment first? Okay, we'll go to public comment. Uh, Gerald Kubatan from Council District 1. Do you wish to speak now or uh, at the end? Okay, why don't we do that? And we'll call up three at a time. Uh, each person has a uh, minute to speak. Uh, the exception, exception of Mr. Gubaltan, who uh, to council courtesy. Uh, so it's uh, Gerald Gubaltan, Hillary Norton, Marilyn Cajon. Uh, Gerald Gubaltan, Senior Planning Deputy with Council Member Cedillo's Office. Uh, we'd like to put forward three proposed suggested amendments. Uh, the first deals with pedestrian planning in disadvantaged communities. Uh, we'd like to offer some language that sort of reinforces the plan's focus on pedestrian pedestrian oriented planning and implementation in disadvantaged communities. Uh, the tool I think we that might be effective and we were offering up is uh, EnviroScreen which is used by Cal EPA in the cap and trade legislation which does define disadvantaged communities. And interestingly when DOT is also prioritizing the top 50 schools in the safe schools uh, safe Routes to uh, Schools initiative, you'll see a correlation between those census tracts that have been identified and those designated within as disadvantaged communities. Uh, so our issue here is just focusing on pedestrian safety and pollution burden and low-income communities. Now, the second amendment we'd like to suggest is uh, promoting broader, more inclusive, and more effective public participation. Um, clearly, the digital divide exists in our city, and we'd like to suggest that uh, the planning department and DOT partner with the city's existing family source center's infrastructure. Uh, we had a very recent experience with DOT and our family source center in facilitating a community workshop around the DASH routes. It was well attended, it was language appropriate, and we collaborated with a nonprofit provider to uh, facilitate that workshop. So we'd like to encourage more inclusive, language appropriate, culturally sensitive public participation. Uh, finally, we have a third amendment which would make modification to network designations in selected streets. Uh, our office did drill down. Uh, we're not doing it arbitrarily or unilaterally. We have in the record kind of our rationale, and so we'd like to uh, modify selected streets with the understanding that this plan is a general guide. It's flexible. It's a policy document. Uh, certain designations certainly could be revisited with meaningful community input. I've distributed to the clerk uh, copies of our suggested amendments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hillary Norton, Marilyn Cohen. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Hillary Norton, and I'm the executive director of FAST, Fixing Angelino Stuck in Traffic. And I know we've had some issues with going fast lately, but the fact is that in many cases we are going not fast at all. Uh, and that what is so impressive about the mobility element today is that it allows us to use intermobility and technology to move us beyond gridlock and into logical and reliable traffic flows. And so we are here as members of the mobility element working group to praise this forward-looking and innovative plan because it really is going to include all of the different modes and encourage people to start their day in one mode and use a multiple of modes throughout that day. In addition, we as 
one of the originators of mobility hubs with LADOT, with planning, we really support the proliferation of mobility hubs, not only to bring pedestrians and uh, Uber and Lyft and taxis and shuttles and buses and transit all together, but to look at access services and to make sure that we are creating safe, restful, cool um, places with restrooms that people can stop at, rest at, and move on to their next mode. By creating these intermodal lifestyles and creating a culture of making sure that we change modes and reduce our um, carbon footprint, we will change our livability in the city. We thank you for creating these vehicle enhanced networks, bike enhanced networks, transit enhanced networks, because as we move our people and our goods and ourselves to transit in other modes, we're going to be making Los Angeles the envy of the nation. Thank you very much today. Thank you. Marilyn Cajon, Bennett Cajon. Hi, um, my name is Marilyn Cohen and I live uh, in Westwood. Uh, this is a pivotal moment in the issue of Westwood bike lanes. We're at the intersection of smart and stupid. How do we define smart? Light rail is finally coming to the west side. Let's optimize the projected 5,000 plus boardings a day at the Westwood station alone. Frequent and predictable shuttles must be added to the current brigade of 800 plus buses a day. If we don't solve the first mile, last mile issue for commuters, we will have squandered the opportunity to actually get people out of their cars. To narrow the vehicle lanes on Westwood to accommodate bike lanes will negate most of the benefits of effectively coordinating mass transit modalities to get people to and from their destinations. There are several examples in the area of narrowed lanes and buses spill over onto adjacent lanes severely backing up traffic. Let's do smart. There will always time to try stupid. Support, support Council Thank Member Corretz. Remove Westwood Thank Boulevard bike lanes. Bennett Cohen, Josh Paget, Paget. My name is Bennett Cohen. The uh, Mobility Plan two th uh, 2035 promotes radical increases in residential den uh, density throughout Los Angeles despite a failing infrastructure unable to support our current needs. From water and power to sidewalk and streets, traffic gridlock and, res and response times of emergency providers to schools over capacity. Our city services are stretched beyond their limits. How can we consider a plan which promotes dramatic upzoning of much of our city and which creates negative environmental impacts which the statement of overriding consideration acknowledges cannot be mitigated? We urge you to reject the mobility plan in its current form so that future needs can be addressed in a thoughtful and balanced manner. Thank you. Thank you. George Paget, or Paget, Robert Pepe. Hi, my name is Josh Paget. I'm the co-chair of the Mid-City West Community Council Transportation, Parking, and Streetscape Committee. And uh, the board of the Mid-City West Community Council has enthusiastically supported many of the elements included in the mobility plan that are within our neighborhood. Uh, specifically, Mid-City West recently uh, developed a plan uh, called the Bicycle Friendly Streets Project that sets up neighborhood greenways as an east-west and a north-south corridor that cuts through our neighborhood. It's a very exciting plan. The City Council uh, submitted it to a grant proposal for um, Metro, and we ranked seventh uh, in the county on the recent Metro Call for Projects. This is a grassroots program where we did lots of public outreach to the neighborhood, and that's what they want, as many of the ideas behind the complete streets that are incorporated in the mobility plan. So grassroots loves it, and I'd encourage the city council to create a comprehensive plan for the entire city rather than leaving it to the piecemeal process of each neighborhood council. Thank you. Robert Pepe, Phil Brown. Good afternoon, honorable council members. Uh, well, I'd like to welcome uh, members Rue and Harrison Dawson to the council. Uh, my name is Robert Pepe. I'm a allegedly rapidly aging member of the city's population. And I'm a homeowner and property taxpayer in Silver Lake neighborhood CD13. I support adopting the mo mobility plan 235, including all of its proposed networks, 
As a pedestrian, cyclist, transit user, and driver, I believe that the plan will make Los Angeles streets safer for all Angelinos. Road calming and better sidewalks and crosswalks and protected bike lanes are an essential part of the plan. Please don't bend to the whim of one council member, as has been done in both Mr. Cedillo's and Mr. Coretz's districts. Where leader, I quote, where leaders have no vision, the people perish. In Mr. Kretz and Sedil's case, already people have been killed on Fig and on Westwood because of lack of safe bike lanes. Thank you. Phil Brown, Margaret Healy. My name is Phil Brown. I have some written documents to leave with you as well. Uh, on a background of this viewpoint, which essentially is one that you have omitted by not allowing consideration for increased capacity in certain corridors, which are certainly needed, especially in the Santa Monica Boulevard corridor, Route 2, and also in the uh, Sepulveda and 405 corridor, you're not going to walk and solve those traffic demands. So specifically, my approach is a new one, and it can double the capacity of existing rights-of-way boulevards without widening, simply by using a better organization technique it can be designed for slow speeds, such as 30 miles an hour. And it's, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Margaret Healy, David Malcolm Carson. Good afternoon. <clears throat> MP 2035 calls for the upzoning of 80% of our city without supporting infrastructure. This in the face of an already stressed power grid, failed sidewalks and streets, traffic congestion and overcrowded schools allowing developers to pile story upon story of small but pricey apartment units on relatively small lots and impinging on single-family homes will create a canyon along Pico Boulevard and will hardly increase the appeal and walkability of the transit corridor, a stated goal of the plan. Adding density at the Westwood station is foolhardy because we already have sufficient ridership at that station. Increased density adding to the congestion on Westwood Boulevard and Pico cannot but impede the transit user struggling to get to and from the expo stations. And imagine the plight of the stroke victim in an ambulance trying to get to UCLA Hospital. Please say no to MP 2035 in its present form. Current zoning allowances will bring a balanced approach and will allow for more than enough growth. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. David Malcolm Carson, Harold. Hatlin, Hatton. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to address you. My name is Malcolm Carson. I'm General Counsel and Policy Director for Environmental Health at the Community Health Councils. Um, as a community health pol and policy organization dedicated to promoting resource, equity, and underserved populations, Community Health Councils commends the City of Los Angeles Planning Department for sustaining efforts to improve the safety, health, economic vitality, and environmental sustainability and quality of life for all Los Angeles travelers. Further, we'd like to extend a great appreciation to DCP staff working on the mobility plan for their responsiveness and accessibility to community concerns during this draft development period. The most revised draft has responded to some of our concerns in particular, including the addition of data-driven prioritization of, pro of projects, which can really um, highlight the issue of safety, public health, equity, access, and economic benefits, and as well the addition of the slow s school zone um, proposal that can really um, impact um, life for kids around uh, neighborhood schools. Thank you very much. Thank you. Harold, it's either Hatton or Hatlin. Not here, Harold Hatton. Har Laurel Lake, Nurit Katz. Good afternoon, I'm Laura Lake. I'm here for Fix the City. Uh, this poster represents my testimony regarding the statement of overriding considerations with a focus 
on public safety. And thank you. Would you vote for a mobility plan that states up front that reducing congestion is not its goal, has a potentially significant and unavoidable negative impact on emergency access and response times, would result in a significant and unavoidable negative impact on roadway congestion, exceeds established thresholds for neighborhood intrusion from cut through traffic, harms habitats and wildlife, provides a road map for development not, re not reduce traffic. This half-baked plan needs to be sent Thank back you. and revised to provide a real mobility plan. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Nurit Katz, Dave Karwask. Hi, thank you. Is it started? Okay. Um, so I'm Nuri Katz. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer and Executive Officer for Facilities Management for UCLA. I want to thank everyone here for all of the hard work that's gone into this plan. I won't echo the overall benefits of the mobility plan. You've heard them again and again. I've never been more excited to be an Angelino. I'm a native, grew up here. This is an amazing time, an amazing plan. I'm here to speak on behalf of the Westwood community. I've heard over and over again from our students, faculty, staff, and community members, homeowners, residents, that they would really like to see bike infrastructure and a complete street in Westwood. I serve on the Mayor's Great Streets Network, and I'm excited about seeing this street become um, fully living up to its potential. But most importantly, what we need now is a study. And so what we're asking for is just to do the study to show that the concepts by our experts which have proven that you can do this study or this, uh, this lane without removing any lanes of traffic or any impacts to parking. Let's do the follow-up engineering study and make this happen. Thank you. Dave Karwask, Deborah Murphy. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Dave Karwaski, speaking on behalf of UCLA Transportation. I'm here today to ask you to approve the new mobility element in its current form and to not remove Westwood Boulevard from the Bike Enhanced Network map. We are concerned for the safety of the hundreds of UCLA staff, faculty, and students who bike on Westwood Boulevard every day, given that, that, it, that it is statistically the second highest street in the city for crashes involving bicyclists. I could argue or suggest that safety is paramount, which of course it is. I could suggest that cities around the world have already learned the lessons of over-reliance on automobiles and are moving quickly to recast their mobility networks and infrastructure. But you already know all of this, and you too probably have the sense that Los Angeles needs to do more to move forward. If this plan is written and implemented, no longer will the city be constrained by the automobile. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah Murphy, Joel Epstein. Good day, Council Members. I'm Deborah Murphy. I'm the Founder and Executive Director of Los Angeles Walks Pedestrian Advocacy Group. I've been Chair of the City's Pedestrian Advisory Committee for the last 17 years, and I served on the Mobility Plan Task Force. As Secretary Trans of Transportation Anthony Fox said, our streets are a reflection of who we are. So are we a city that cares about people as they move around, whether they want to be walking, biking, taking the bus, as a child, getting to school, or as a driver, a senior, or a person with disabilities. Our streets are a vital part of our open space network and serve the people who live, work, and play and get to school as a conduit for their everyday lives. This mobility plan puts safety first. It establishes the goal of Vision Zero, about reducing traffic fatalities to zero. We look to make sure that LA is a first-class infrastructure that allows for everyone, whether they walk, bike, drive or take transit. We need choices. We don't just need one way to get around. We need multiple ways to get around. All of us can be each of those users. Thank you. Thank you. Joel Epstein, Veronica Olmos. Is it Epstein? No. Epstein, Epstein. It's all the same okay. to me. Um, anyway, my name is Joel Epstein, Epstein, uh, and I'm just uh, here to express my wholehearted support for the plan as is, including the bike lanes on Westwood Boulevard. It's a great plan. Thank you to the council for your hard work on this. And let's move LA forward by, uh, by supporting the plan. Thanks. Thank you. Veronica Olmos, Margarita Alvarez Gomez. 
Good afternoon. My name is Veronica Olmos, and I am the Executive Director of Central City Neighborhood Partners, a nonprofit organization located in the Westlake District and operator of the city's Westlake Pico Union Family Source Center. And I am here today to request that pedestrian safety be elevated as a priority in the mobility plan. Over the last several years, CCMP has led three community-driven transportation plans through Caltrans Environmental Justice Planning Grants. Each of these planning grants involved publicly engaging our city's most vulnerable in the transportation planning, and it's unfortunate that our expertise in leading public participation among vulnerable populations were not asked or, in, or taken into account. But I can share with you from leading this work the utmost importance for Westlake residents is improving pedestrian safety, particularly children, elder, elderly, and the mobility impaired, and therefore request that within the mobility plan that pedestrian safety be elevated as a priority. Thank you. Thank you. Margarita Alvarez Gomez, Maria Elena Garcia. Good afternoon. My name is Margarita Alvarez Gomez, and I live and work in the Westlake area. I've heard over the several months regarding the planning, and DOT has been working on a mobility plan that has collected community input from outreach efforts. However, according to the paper, this paper, uh, most of the people who, answer, who went to these meetings were 41 years of age, and they were males living in zip codes that did not reflect the Westlake area. Um, or the community, it doesn't express the concerns of the outreach efforts for the Westlake area. Um, it's limited in scope because it has not reached the vulner vulnerable populations. Um, we know that the vulnerable populations will not use the platforms on the internet, so I'm here to ask that um, this plan includes the priorities that will benefit these communities, engage the underserved neighborhoods, and Thank you. give priority to seniors. Thank you. Maria Elena Garcia, Brent Butterworth. Buenas tardes. Voy a hablar en español. Un momento. Deje ver si hay alguien aquí que pueda traducir. Is there a translator here? Okay, si habla en español y después uh, voy a hacer lo mejor yo para decir lo que usted dice en inglés. Okay. Gracias. Gracias. I'll try to interpret after uh, she speaks. Thanks. Um, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es María Elena García. Yo vivo y trabajo en el área de Wesley. Quiero agradecer al DOT por haber traído una reunión para hablar acerca de la expansión de la ruta del Dash en nuestra comunidad. Esta reunión fue en el Centro Comunitario CCMP y esto fue muy bueno porque yo y otros miembros pudimos asistir para dar nuestra opinión. También supimos que la reunión del DASH en CCMP fue una de las que hubo más, más gente y por eso estamos aquí para hacer recomendaciones. Nos gustaría que hubiera más reuniones como el de DASH acerca del plan de movilización de 2035 ya, yo no sabía cómo era el plan y luego me explicaron que se había hecho por internet y otras juntas, pero esto no sabíamos, la mayoría de las personas de nuestra comunidad no usamos internet y entonces no podemos tomar participación de estos proyectos que afectan directamente a la comunidad en que vivimos. Por favor, tengan… tengan perdón, Gracias. Gracias. One second, we'll try our best to say what uh, she said. My Hello, my name is Maria Elena Garcia. I live and work uh, in the, I think she said the um, Westlake area. I want to thank DOT for coming to speak to us about DASH and the roots that DASH has in the area. It, it was a very good meeting because it allowed us to give our opinion. Uh, this uh, meeting, I understand, was one where there was the most people who attended. However, uh, we want more meetings like this. However, uh, we did not, some of us here do not have access to the internet, and that is the way this meeting was uh, uh, mentioned. And uh, if we do not know this, we cannot participate. So please have uh, better outreach on this. That pretty much sums it up, I think. Uh, Brent Butterworth, Gene Ambrewster. Hi, my name is Brent Butterworth. I'm from Canoga Park. I've been here about 13 years, and I've bicycled the entire city. I want to speak in favor of uh, bike lanes in particular on uh, Westwood because the whole west side is basically kind of a black hole for bike access. As soon as you hit the west side, there's almost no bike lanes. You're right in the middle of traffic, and it's very unsafe. 
Uh, on Reseda, up in the valley, we just put in a traffic diet where we have, uh, just south of uh, CSUN, we have uh, parking and bike lanes and, uh, and, and four lanes of traffic instead of six lanes of traffic. And it's really great. People are out walking, people are biking, the merchants are getting more uh, business. You know, they're doing sidewalk shops and things like that now. And it's, it's for people, it's not just for cars anymore. And I think that with somewhere between a quarter and a third of urban real estate devoted to car access, it's time to do something for people. Thanks. Thank you. Gene Ambrister, Ryan Snyder. Good afternoon. My name is Jean Armbruster, and I'm the director of the PLACE program at the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. I'm pleased to be here today on behalf of the department to express our support for the Mobility Plan 2035. Transportation and health are inextricably linked. Behaviors such as diet and exercise are clearly important to our health, but the physical and social environments that surround us profoundly influence these behaviors and our ability to make healthy choices. The Mobility Plan 2035 underscores the importance of a safe transportation system that serves multiple needs, including public health priorities, such as reducing injury and death from traffic collisions, increasing physical activity, cleaning the air, and promoting social cohesion. Through implementation of the plan, Los Angeles will create safer and more health-promoting environments, an urgent priority given the human and economic toll of traffic injuries and deaths and chronic disease in the city. The Department of Public Health is committed to working with the city to make this a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan Snyder, James O'Sullivan. Thank you. My name is Ryan Snyder. I'm a transportation planning consultant who prepares quite a few complete transportation plans. I'm also a resident of Westwood. I'm here to enthusiastically support this plan. As someone who's been coming to this body for about 30 years, trying to encourage this city to look at things that transportation this way, I'm excited about it. I want to specifically speak to Westwood Boulevard. Um, it is used by many on bicycle. Many people are getting hit. Uh, it is a university community. It is the primary access to UCLA, and people need a good way of getting in to there. I prepared a plan that takes no parking away, that takes no lanes away, that doesn't interfere with anybody. There are no good policy arguments for taking Westwood Boulevard off of this plan. I just want to close by saying that, look, we're not forcing everybody to get in a bicycle. We're just saying for those people who want to live a healthy, sustainable lifestyle, it ought to be available. Thank you. Thank you. James O'Sullivan, Stuart Waldman. Council members, <clears throat> my name is James O'Sullivan. I'm with Fix the City. Um, put safety first. Interesting. Because this plan has a statement of overriding considerations that says it will increase congestion, slow response times, and endanger species and habitats. Now, if you were doctors, your job would be to do no harm. As government officials, your job is to put safety first, to protect the public. That, this plan does not do this. Increased congestion produces more ultra-fine particles, which leads to childhood asthma and pulmonary heart disease. Slower response times means that the people suffering from asthma and heart disease will have to wait longer for the ambulances to get there with questionable results. You should be sending this back. I don't know what you're going to do, but we in the community are going to go after the 85% who must drive cars and let them know what's going on down here because right now they have no idea. Thank you. Thank you. Stuart Waldman, Dustin Baton. Stuart Waldman, president of VICA. Uh, VICA appreciates this final product, a huge improvement to the previous piecemeal and often disjointed approach to transportation and street improvements. What we have in front of us is a roadmap of mobility projects that will provide the most benefits for the greatest number of users. The plans for vehicle enhanced networks will make our streets work for everyone. People who drive, people who walk, people who bike, people who take transit. This plan in conjunction with the county's proposed ballot measure will tackle the large and small problems with our connectivity, safety, and commute times. We ask that there be a clear process 
for continued public outreach and transparency about how this plan is being implemented and funded. We want to ensure the Valley is actually getting its fair share of improvements and enhancements and that we are not left with subpar corridors wondering when we would be focused on. As a result of these months of public input and feedback, we now have a comprehensive, integrated, and connected plan for all modes. Thank you. Thank you. Dustin Baton, Alicia Witzling. Good afternoon. I'm Dustin Batten with the Los Angeles County Business Federation, BizFed, representing 140 business groups, 272,000 employers, and over 3 million employees across the county. We want to urge the passage of the mobility element today as adopted by the Planning Commission and commend the work of the Planning Department and LA DOT in completing such a visionary document with such a thorough community outreach plan. For the past eight years, BizFed has polled its members and saving commute time has been one of the top five issues for five years running. BizFed encourages the city to work towards mobility solutions that improve commute times and provide more predictable commute routes. Doing so will help our economy thrive and improve livability and reduce stress, which will make this region that much more productive. We especially support investing in the vehicle enhanced network, which will help improve people, which will help move people, goods, and transit and access vehicles more efficiently on our roadways and help people get to and from transit stations through carpool, shuttle, taxi, car share, etc., rather than being in gridlock trying to get to these stations. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia Witzling, Ken Hickson. Hi, I'm Alicia Witzling. I'm here on behalf of the LA Area Chamber of Commerce and our over 1,600 members who employ 650,000 people throughout the region to lend our support for Mobility Plan 2035. We're particularly supportive of the proposed um, vehicle enhanced network and freight related programs and policies. We believe connecting the city's uh, key arterials to the regional freeway system um, via the VEN is critical to the future competitiveness of LA's economy. Uh, in order to reduce traffic congestion and improve mobility for all Angelinos, the city will have to provide better alternative modes of transportation. For that reason, we support strategic investments in improved active transportation infrastructure, but not at the expense of improving and maintaining our roads, streets, and highways. We believe the city should balance its transportation investments across all modes, including roads, streets, and highways. This plan does that. Uh, goods movement in LA is the largest economic sector, and like other transportation users, goods movement companies are limited in the transportation modes they can utilize to deliver goods, um, and this program will help lend uh, better you. arterial highways and uh, access for them. Thank you. Thank you. Ken Hickson, Debbie Nussbaum. Hello, I'm Ken Hickson. I'm Vice President of the Miracle Mile Residential Association. This plan is touted as aspirational, but so is putting lipstick on a pig. This plan is an attempt to prettify, prettify, pr prettify the ugly truth about congestion in Los Angeles. It gives short shrift to the majority of commuters by expending, expending so much energy on policies that purport to improve any and everything but congestion. There's a difference between aspirational and delusional. You can attribute, attribute the goals of this plan to the former, but the results will prove to be the latter. Thank you. Thank you. Debbie Nussbaum, Zach Rem. Hi, I'm Debbie Nussbaum, and I'm concerned about safety. Westwood Boulevard doesn't need a road diet. According to the Waze app, the average speed is 11 miles per hour. Heavy traffic volumes and the number of signalized intersections contribute to this. There isn't any extra road uh, width to carve out for bike lanes. Um, and there are other factors that, are, that uh, can't be mitigated, like rider visibility, parking turnover, driveways, alleys, intersections. Also, there are 800 to 900 buses every day on Westwood Boulevard. It far exceeds the number of cyclists traveling on Westwood Boulevard. Consider the number of commuters in each bus. By the way, buses are eight and a half uh, feet wide plus mirrors. Uh, can a bus driver safely center his bus on a nine foot road dieted lane? Bike uh, lanes between curbs and parked parking would be the worst. Bus riders would have to walk across protected bike lanes and board and exit. Thank you. Zach Rem, Hayaran Lee. 
Thank you. Uh, I appreciated Council Member Huizar's introduction, which described the plan as progressive and forward thinking and take into consideration a context of different streets and users. Uh, I also enjoyed the planning director's description of the four-year planning effort, the hundreds of city staff members, and the dozens of private organizations that contributed to this plan. Uh, I've read the plan. I think it's progressive, and I think it will benefit all Angelinos, all four million. Uh, while being considerate of, again, the context of different streets, different neighborhoods, different users, different forms of transportation. Uh, for those reasons, I urge you to adopt the plan as it's written and drafted and submitted to you today. Uh, I've heard that Councilmember Koretz may make a motion and Councilmember Cedillo has already made a, ma a motion which will change or delays the plan's implementation. Uh, I don't believe that's necessary and I don't believe it would benefit all Angelinos. I think those motions are cynical and self-serving and we don't need them. So please support the plan as it's submitted today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hiran Lee, Daryl Clark. Hello, my name is Heron and I'm the Policy and Outreach Coordinator at LA County Bicycle Co Coalition. Before I joined the organization, I was a local advocate who was working on the Westwood uh, bike, bike lanes. Um, currently, there are almost eight, 800 people using the Westwood and LeConte uh, entrance uh, on the bicycle, and there are 3,000 people riding to UCLA every day. And this is the street that people actually use without any proper bicycle infrastructure. Um, we, uh, I've been working on this campaign for almost four years now, and uh, we've gathered 1,500 signatures on Westwood, and plus the streets like Figueroa gathered the 2,500 uh, 2, signatures. Uh, we, wh whenever we ask for support, we never, uh, we don't really get no from people because people want safe streets. I urge uh, the council to support the current mobility plan which will improve accessibility, connectivity, and safety, and please keep it as is. Thank you. Thank you. Daryl Clark, NWA. Hello, I'm Daryl Clark, uh, co-chair of the Sierra Club Angeles Chapters Conservation Committee, representing 40,000 members in LA and Orange County, and also lead of our national Healthy Communities and Transportation team. I'd like to commend the huge amount of effort that went into this plan toward making LA the inviting, bikeable, walkable, transit-friendly, leading city that we seek. And I'd also note regarding bicycles that they really depend on connected networks. Pieces don't work so well. The Sierra Club has explicitly endorsed new bike lanes in Westwood in addition, of course, to good bus linkage to the Expo Line Station. You know, and just in parting, you think about young, healthy students at UCLA. Gee, you think more would bike there if it was safer? Isn't that a neat idea? Gee, why can't we do that? Thank you. Thank you. NWA Mehmet Berker. These are you referring to niggers without attitude? Because the subject of the matter is outcry, outcry, outcry. For how many years have we waited during your nine years as a councilman to see improvements on our streets and sidewalks? But with little disregard for you underscore what the people want and do what your pay-for-play players pay you to do, you little puppet. Sir, so the, if you could address so the, the uh, Mr. NWA, congestion. Mr. Herman, Mr. Herman, I'm calling your attention. If you do not follow the decorum and rules in this committee, you would be asked to leave. Now, I'm asking you to address the full committee on this subject on the agenda. If you do not do that, as you do not do it in council meetings, I will have no patience for your outbursts and ask you to leave this committee meeting. Thank you. Please proceed, and you have 26 seconds. So the outcry, again, has to do with infrastructure planning to make everyone involved in their communities, not just take regards to your action of what you find better or even improvements, but you've created a problematic concern to address the real issue of what is a network of circulation for streets and sidewalk for safety and our health and welfare. Thank you. Bone Mehmet Berker, 
And Jim McQuiston. Uh, great, thanks. I'd like to thank the committee. My name is Mehmet Berker. I'm a steering committee member of Los Angeles Walks and a Los Angeles resident. Some of the most crucial obstacles to living in LA that this council well knows are affordability and transportation. Um, and as a renter and someone who does not own a car, these obstacles are, for me, as they are for most Angelinos, preeminent. This mobility plan is a step to creating a more affordable and livable city. But more than that, the mobility plan finally recognizes that the safety of all Angelinos is a crucial element of our transportation network. All Angelinos, regardless of how they are getting about sit the city at one time or another, deserve to be as safe as possible. Uh, we've done things by the old way for so long. Uh, we deserve policies that improve the safety of all Angelinos and result in fewer ambulances being called out in the first place. Thanks. Jim McQuiston, Daniela Ward. Jim McQuiston, you know, you can do this any way you want, but remember, when you do this, this is part of the general plan, you're stuck with it. You can't do ad hoc changes to this plan. That means you have to live by it, every single dot. Look at what I've uh, submitted to you and think about it. Thank you. Daniela Ward, Jeff Jacoberger. urban planning grad student and researcher. The half mile strip between Westwood Boulevard, I'm sorry, on Westwood Boulevard between Wellworth and the main entrance of campus has a collision rate of more than eight times greater than that would be expected of city, given citywide data. Please bear in mind that the population surrounding UCLA is largely, largely composed of young, unexperienced cyclists often unaware of the importance of filing police reports to begin with. I have here, um, nearly 200 postcards for Councilman Coretz from students and staff biking to UCLA within a few hours that we collected from a table on Westwood Boulevard um, expressing all sorts of reasons why they would like to see bike lanes on Westwood Boulevard. As the fifth largest employer in the county with bold sustainability goals, cycling has been well incentivized and highly supported infrastructurally as evidenced by the tripling of biking to UCLA since 2008. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jeff Jacoberger, Eric Bruins. Good afternoon, Jeff Jacoberger. I'm the chair of the city's bicycle advisory committee and the uh, bicycle advisory committee urges um, the council to adopt the mobility element and support the network as is, including Westwood Boulevard and, uh, you know, I'm not sure what um, changes CD1 has proposed, but since none of us have seen them, we'd ask that you not um, implement changes that nobody's had an opportunity to review. Um, you know, on a personal matter, I also serve on um, Metro's Westside Central Service Council. And um, the transit, uh, transit improvements are also very important. I'd say one thing about um, transit and bike. LA has a fantastic transit network until about 8 o'clock at night and then the frequency drops off and you often see people who are taking transit during the day and a lot of low income workers from restaurants and service industries riding their bikes home at night when it's dark and unsafe and we need safe networks um, for the lower income um, elements of our community. Thank you. Thank you. Eric Bruins, Melanie Freeland. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is Eric Bruins. I'm the policy director at the Los Angeles County Bicycle Coalition. We stand here asking you to uh, pass this plan as is with no changes, particularly the changes proposed by CD5 and CD1 are problematic for a number of reasons. This, this plan is, is a balanced, complete streets approach that provides access to key destinations for all modes of travel, and we need to make sure that all of those destinations are, in fact, served by all modes, including the, our UCLA, which is the second greatest generator of bicycle trips in the city of Los Angeles, CD5 unfortunately proposes to remove it from the bicycle network, which is simply an untenable position for, for the city of Los Angeles. This plan is, is built on the foundation of the plan for a healthy Los Angeles, so it integrates health and equity throughout the document. It puts safety first, which aligns with the LADOT strategic plan. 
it can, the staff conducted extensive outreach over the past four years. What, we, what we're seeing today is that this plan unites a bunch of themes that, that the city has really pursued over the past five years, and it builds upon that progress, and, and we need to build on that foundation and, and pass this plan with no changes. Thank you. Thank you. Melanie Freeland, Megan Fury. Hi, thank you, committee. My name is Melanie Freeland. I'm an architect at Gensler and also a CD1 resident. Um, I ride my bike um, weekly to downtown LA. I want to thank everyone for their hard work on this plan and everything that has gone into it thus far and urge the committee to pass it in its entirety. Um, I'm also a mother of a young daughter, and I look forward to the day when Los Angeles can say that we are a uh, vision zero. We have zero related traffic deaths, and I think that this plan is a fantastic step towards that. So again, I encourage you to pass the plan in its entirety. Thank you. Megan Fury, Kent Strumpel. Hello, my name is Megan Fury. I'm a representative of the Westwood Village Improvement Association. We believe safety is really important and we want this plan to, to stay for Westwood Boulevard. Um, Westwood Boulevard is a main thoroughfare for the UCLA community, the merchants in the area, and the locals. We believe that it should stay inside the plan and not be removed. Thank you. Thank you. Kent Strumpel, Dennis Hinman. Hello, Kent Strumpel. Um, I'm a member of the City of LA's Bicycle Advisory Committee, speaking on my own behalf today. Uh, I want to urge you to approve the mobility plan with all of the modal networks intact so that we can continue to refine them and address any community concerns that are brought up by them. Uh, I also want to address a suggestion that's uh, been made by others that incorporating bikeways or innovative roadway designs might impact uh, emergency response time. Uh, we need to keep in mind that emergencies that are impacted by increased response times require a rare convergence of extraordinary events. In contrast, uh, the enhanced safety that's created by bikeways and other innovative uh, safety enhancements uh, benefit the community 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we really need to balance out these concerns about emergency response with the very real constant benefits that, uh, to safety. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis Hidman, Valerie Keegan. Hi, my name is Dennis Hyman. Uh, every year that uh, Census Bureau does household surveys, one of the questions is commutes, what's your main form of commuting to work, and also the commute times. Well, for 2013, bro bro broken down by uh, population track, from about half a uh, mile west of Vine Street all the way to the beach, it has some of the lowest commute times in the entire city. And that is obviously not because of how level of congestion, it's how close you are to your work. Uh, San Francisco, Chicago, and New York City all have higher commute times than Los Angeles does. Uh, in the year 2000, there was uh, 134 people commuting by car, truck, and van uh, compared to one bi bicycle commuting to work. In uh, 2013, that shrunk to 64 to 1. Uh, the next results would probably be about 50 to 1. And the uh, is it bicycle lanes are proven to improve the safety. Um, and also, you must consider that people that don't or are confined to wheelchairs have to use sidewalks to get where they're going. Thank you very much. Thank you. Valerie Keegan, I'm not here. She's left. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Mark Valiantos, Valiantos and Fernando Casares. Oh, sorry about that. Butchered your name. Mark Valianatos, and yeah. I'm a resident of CD1, teach at Occidental College, involved with a number of pedestrian and bike organizations around town. I want to strongly urge uh, passage of the mobility element. will make the city healthier, uh, make our streets more complete, green, safe, and vibrant. And also, as a resident of the first council district, I want to speak out against this effort to remove 12 um, lanes from the bike network. It's, um, I consider it to be some are cowardly and disgusting to not consult the residents of the district and bring this list to, um, at this late moment, to, to the plan. And I urge you to pass the plan as, as it was originally drafted. Thank you. Thank you. Fernando Casares, Joanne Garb. Good 
Good afternoon, uh, committee chairs and members. My name is Fernando Casares with the Natural Resources Defense Council. I grew up in South Central LA and attended school in Northwest and Chatsworth, and I wholeheartedly support this plan as is. The transportation sector is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in our city. Greenhouse gas emissions are the leading cause of human-made climate change, which exacerbates natural disasters such as the drought that we're living and the wildfires that are raging in Northern California. But this mobility plan is a lot, is about a lot more than just emissions. It's about the type of communities and the quality of life that we want our children and grandchildren to have. Do we want them to live in a city, that, a city that continues to have the worst traffic congestion in the nation, with Angelinos wasting over 95 hours a year during rush hour, which in the process creates ground level ozone, which exacerbates asthma and respiratory illnesses? Or do we want them to live in a city that provides them a mature multimodal transportation network, including the safety of walking and biking in their neighborhoods and the efficient transporting of people through mass rail and transit? Thank you. Thank you. Joanne Garb, Aaron Jimenez. Before we encourage people to walk, perhaps we should invest in fixing our sidewalks. As a budget advocate, I have to ask, how are we going to pay for this? This concerns me. We still don't have the money to fix our streets, and we don't have the money to fix our sidewalks. My kids tried biking about 10 years ago. My, daughter, my oldest was almost hit by a car, which resulted in her being frightened, falling off her bike, and breaking her wrist. You can't walk over the sidewalks. And it's getting worse. I have a member of my government relations committee on our neighbor council who will not bike after dark because he is afraid. And this is in West Hills and on Sherman Way. He's afraid. It, it is definitely a problem. We have to change people's attitudes toward bikers before we can encourage people to bike. There has to be a consideration for their safety. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron Jimenez, Natu Flores, Nato Flores. Good afternoon. My name is Aaron Jimenez. I'm here representing the Central City Association. CCA represents a broad swath of businesses that drive the Los Angeles economy and knows a robust transportation network is vital to continued investment. CCA supports the proposed mobility plan 2035 and its vision for a world-class transportation system that balances the needs of all road users. We commend the Department of City Planning for the extensive outreach that was done to obtain input for this plan. The Mobility Plan 2035 incorporates complete streets principles and lays a policy framework to address mobility issues while updating the city's 1989 transportation element. CCA believes the plan advances the city's transportation goals, including safety and improved infrastructure. Thank you. Nato Flores, Jed White. My name is Nato Flores and I support the mobility plan. I'd like to thank the council for uh, taking the leadership on this. Sometimes it takes responsible and brave government to do these kind of things. If we didn't have good governments, we wouldn't have had the civil rights uh, legislation that we did in the 60s. At the same time, even though it's not going to solve it, we're addressing uh, climate change, which is caused by humans. Uh, we can't release all the products of combustion from all the hydrocarbons that have, been, that have been stored on this earth for billions of years in a matter of a few hundred and not think it's not going to affect the planet. Uh, the president uh, this week or last week uh, came up with new standards for that, for reducing hydrocarbons. And this plan does some of that, and I really thank you all for doing this, and I hope you adopt it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jed White, Jessica Amini. Good afternoon. My name is Jed White. I'm an attorney and partner at Brian Cave, but more importantly, I'm a husband and father in the Westwood neighborhood. I'm invested in my neighborhood thriving, and for that reason, I fully support bike lanes on Westwood Boulevard. I want the neighborhood to be safe and enjoyable for walking my five-year-old daughter, not just now, but 20 years from now, and bike lanes are critical for that effort. In addition to bike lanes on Westwood, I support all the networks in the mobility plan. I am a bicycle commuter, and the bike lanes are necessary for my safety as a cyclist. The west, the west side in particular has become too dense to drive. I get to and from work faster on my bike than I do my car, and bicycle lanes would help keep me safe. Please support the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica Mini, Victor Aquino. 
Good afternoon, council members. My name is Jessica Meany, and I'm the managing director of Investing in Place. And I also live in Council District 13, and I've chosen to live car-free in Los Angeles since 1998, so over 15 years. To me, I feel recognized by you, by, the, by our city, and that we want to prioritize how people move, not just cars. And so it's an exciting day. I encourage you to adopt this. And let's get to work on the implementation plan. Let's get to work on the finance plan. Our region will consider our fourth transportation sales tax for the ballot in 2016. How are we ensuring that these needs represented in this plan and our growing sidewalk issues that we heard another um, woman comment on are primed and ready for this expenditure plan? And how are we ensuring that we are prioritizing low-income co communities, communities of color, just like they do in the Bay Area, just like they do in state policy? And I would urge us to look at those um, definitions of disadvantaged communities, actually go beyond Cal Enviro screen, and there's some better metrics out there that SCAG is considering, Metro is considering, and I urge the city of Los Angeles to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Victor Aquino, Beltran, Emanuel. Good afternoon, honorable council members. My name is Victor, and I'm both an organizer with Trust South LA and a resident of South LA near the intersection of uh, Figueroa and Vernon. Uh, so far today, I've taken about two bus trips, a uh, two mile ride on the Metro Line 45, about a half mile trip on the Dash Southeast where a bus bench um, has been removed but hasn't been replaced for about a week now. Um, <clears throat> I then pedaled for about three miles round trip to run a few errands. Um, and although I feel safe as an able-bodied um, male cyclist, I know for a fact that many other families would, um, you know, be more uh, encouraged to purchase a bike if, if, there's a, if there's a safe, um, you know, if there's safe infrastructure. Um, lastly, most recently I carpooled to get here today. That's another five miles. And although I haven't owned a car for five years, I... Um, you know, the few times I do use it, I, you know, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I say all that to say that uh, I feel pretty confident that approving this plan is going to begin to address the healthy and uh, thank you. transportation options in South Italy. Thank you. Thank you. Beltrana Manuel, Dr. Agustin Taylor. Beltrana Manuel. Not here. D Dr. Angust Angustus Taylor. And after the doctors, Estuardo David Mazargaregos. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I come down here. Um, I'm a Dr. Taylor. I'm a retired teacher. And I've been around for about 30 years in the L.A. community. And I've been uh, uh, riding that long at the same time, uh, bicycle riding. And it's been a, a perilous journey. It's been a perilous journey. Uh, uh, I've had, I ride, many times I ride the sidewalks precisely because on the streets it's so dangerous. It's so dangerous on the streets. I've had, uh, just recently I almost was hit, almost recently. And so, as I look at, at all the things that happen, I'm in, I'm in South Central, and I look at uh, the, the very meager, the very meager uh, uh, bicycle riding safety procedures there, compared with some places like, like downtown LA where there are tremendous bike lanes in those areas that are serving gentrified, uh, gentrified uh, uh, communities. Thank you, sir. And thank so I just want to say you, that because I feel it's a, like it's a systemic evil. Thank you, what sir. Well, yeah, it's the art of time, sir. It was one minute per speaker. Thank you. Great, thank you. Estuardo David Masariegos. Hello, committee. How are you guys doing today? I uh, just wanted to come here as an organizer for Trust South LA and also a resident of Los Angeles. Um, I'm in support of the mobility plan, but also want to see it uh, distributed equity, equ equitable uh, throughout the city, specifically in underserved communities like South LA. Um, in South LA, we face the risk of being ran over uh, just walking down the street, biking down our neighborhood. Um, just 
you know, having a bike ride, a, a one, two mile bike ride, we put our, our lives in risk. So definitely please take a look at the plan. Make sure that we have all the protections that we deserve in South LA. Um, and really come out and represent for an underrepresented community. So, um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Sandy Brown, followed by Jerry Brown, followed by Steve Sand. Good afternoon. I'm Sandy Brown. I'm president of Homey Westwood Property Owners Association and on the board of the Neighborhood Council. Um, I first just want to thank Paul Koretz, our councilman, for all of the work that he has done, the community involvement, reaching out to every single group on this issue. Westwood Boulevard is a very high profile street and there are a lot of speakers um, addressing it today. Um, but he did ask in a letter on May 13th, 2014 to my law that Westwood Boulevard be removed. And that was based on tremendous community support. We do support alternatives. We ask that you focus on alternatives for Westwood Boulevard and that you support Council Member Koretz in his desire to see Westwood Boulevard removed from the plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jerry Brown, followed by uh, Steve Sand, followed by Rocco Hernandez. Jerry Brown, president of the Westwood Neighborhood Council, which has repeatedly voiced its opposition to the implementation of new bicycle lanes on Westwood Boulevard because of our concerns about the safety on Westwood Boulevard. It is an extremely heavily traveled street. The intersection of Wilshire and Westwood Boulevard in the a.m. and p.m. hours combined shows 360 motorized, uh, 360 two-wheeled vehicles including bicycles, scooters, and motorcycles, 757 buses, and 29,800 motorized uh, cars. Sorry. There are nearly 900 buses uh, traversing Westwood Boulevard in the course of a day. The plan indicates that uh, its implementation would result in either the narrowing or loss of traffic lanes, and the resulting impact on that for traffic far and wide is enormous. As you know, Westwood Boulevard is very close to the 405 freeway. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Steve Sand, followed by Rocco Hernandez, followed by Perius Pillay. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Steve Sand. I'm the chairman of the Westwood Community Council. And I just want to echo the two previous speakers' comments and many others that you have heard. The Westwood community supports bike lanes where they are safe. And for all the reasons that you have heard, but I just want to emphasize that Westwood Boulevard is basically a transit corridor. Westwood Boulevard between LeConte and Wilshire contains and, and supports and sustains some of the highest numbers of buses in the county of Los Angeles, approaching 1,000 per day. To have these buses lumbering in lanes that are narrow to as small as nine feet is a traffic and safety disaster. That's why we support alternative locations for bike lanes. There are many ways to get to Westwood Boulevard, whether it's Sepulveda or whether it is Gailey, whether it is Veteran. There are other alternative routes, but Westwood Boulevard is not safe. And in the strongest possible way, I wish to urge you to support the amendment that our council member Paul Kretz has put forth. Thank you. Thank you. Rocco Hernandez, followed by Parias Pillay and Tamika Butler. Hi, my name is Rocio Hernandez, uh, and I wanted apologies. to yeah, and I wanted to support the mobility plan in its full. I'm proud to be. I'm proud to say that I'm a second generation Angelino, raised without a car. My mother didn't have a car, and it's gotten a lot better actually in the time that I've grown up. And um, I just wanted to say that I think we should keep, I know Tadio is planning, is suggesting that we take out some bike lanes or from the bicycle network, but I think we should keep the plan as it is. So thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Peria Spille. I am the secretary of the Southern California Transit Advocates. I've lived in Los Angeles for 30 years without a car. Uh, 30 years with riding buses and 25 years riding trains. And as I looked at the mobility plan, I like everything it says about transportation. But 
uh, the main complaint people often make is the speed or rather the lack of speed. Buses move very slowly in LA, even the rapid buses, and so do the light rail trains. The red and purple line trains can move fast because they're underground. The green line moves fast because it's totally grid separated. But the blue and Expo and all the other light rail lines, gold and the new Crenshaw line, they are impeded by cars. So we need signal priority and signal preemption for trains that carry hundreds of people rather than cars that carry one or two people. Thank you. Tamika Butler followed by Adam Malavani. Good afternoon. My name is Tamika Butler and I'm the executive director of the Los Angeles County Bicycle Coalition. And I'm just here to say that we're in complete support of the mobility plan as is. Any changes to the mobility plan or any, you know, streets indicated in the mobility plan will stop LA from what we've been trying to accomplish for the last several years, which is to make a connected network. And even though it just seems like taking one street out here or there won't make that big of a difference, it really impacts people's mobility from community to community. Because as all of you know, just because there is a different district, it doesn't mean that we as individuals stop riding our bike or stop walking or stop driving just because we're crossing that line. I also want to say that we've done so much over these last several years for outreach and any amendments or anything that comes forward has to include outreach, particularly for low-income folks of color who need to have a voice in this movement. When we say that we want to make changes, we have to make sure that we're including those folks. Just because folks may be low-income or folks of color doesn't mean they don't bike or walk and they need to be thought about as well. Thank you. Thank you. Final speaker is Adam Malavani. I wasn't planning on being up here, but uh, somebody told me about it, so I rode my electric bicycle from Venice Beach. Didn't take long, about 50 miles. I mean, 50 minutes, I should say. And I just want to say it's really exciting what's happening here, and uh, I love it that sounds like it's a very pro-bike uh, thing that's going on here and I just want to encourage you uh, to be friendly to electric bicycles also because it allows a lot of people who may not be in great shape or have farther to go to use bicycles and it really just comes down to being a bike like other bikes also. Thank you. Good work. Thank you. Uh, that concludes public comment. What is your name, sir? Harold Hahn from the Burton Way Homeowners Association. Oh, that's our mistake, sir. Please go ahead. Um, my association area includes the, the Cedar sinai Medical Center, as well as the Beverly Center, as well as several hotels. It sits on 3rd Street, portions of 3rd Street and La Cienega Boulevard, which are substandard highways. The adoption of this plan would negatively impact the safety of our area. The co-chair mentioned that this is a paradigm for the city, and I agree, but it is a negative paradigm, not a positive paradigm. And one more personal issue. My last birthday brought me well into my 80s. I'm not as spry as I was when I was a youngster in my 70s, and quite frankly, with the impacts that this, the negative impacts of this mobility plan, I don't think I would feel very safe traversing our congested streets. Nor have, um, as well, I have I a problem with maybe expecting a emergency vehicle to my house. I would suggest you remand this plan back to the planning commission, Thank to the sir. planning staff, excuse me, to look again whether this actually positively would impact the residents of Los Angeles. Th thank you very and much. Thank you. Thank you. So that concludes public comment. We'll be going to uh, comments and questions from the members of the committee. Uh, perhaps if planning and uh, DOT staff could come back up to the table. And uh, just to sort of start us out, there were, uh, 
one or two things I heard sort of as recurring themes or questions or concerns about the, the plan. I wonder if, if uh, any of you could address the concern voiced by folks about the statement of overriding considerations uh, and, and, and the findings being made in that. Uh, my understanding was that that was sort of a, a, a worst case scenario, assuming that every project was done and that there was no behavioral change or no mode changes uh, among people, which of, of course we're, we're seeing happening already, but I wonder if you could respond in more detail. Certainly. Uh, again, Ken Bernstein with Department of City Planning. Um, first of all, we do want to point out, uh, obviously, the fullest discussion of these impacts is in the environmental impact uh, report itself, and we've prepared much more detailed responses uh, on this point that we'd refer the Council to. Um, the EIR does identify significant impacts, but in very limited uh, impact areas in uh, transportation, in noise and vibration, and in biological uh, resources. Um, the, the reason for those impacts is that, in many ways, the EIR is making very conservative assumptions um, with respect to impacts, recognizing this is a citywide plan. As we said, it's very much an aspirational plan. And in many cases, it's difficult to know precisely where uh, and how um, specific improvements and infrastructure changes uh, will be implemented. Um, in addition, we are relying on the most conservative assumptions in terms of our um, underlying traffic model, in terms of trip generation and trip length. Um, and we're not fully realizing the benefits that we'll ultimately see as, ne as these networks get built out and as um, behavior changes uh, throughout the city. So we are using current methodology to assume uh, and, and study impacts of changes uh, where we think that there will be greater benefits uh, over the years. So we've taken the most conservative assumptions in those areas. In addition, um, CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act, requires that we compare impacts in 2035 through the ultimate build out of improvements with this project with uh, existing conditions. And between now and 2035, it is assumed that as a city we are going to grow by about 10% uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of population. And in many of these impact areas, we would be seeing impacts even under the no project alternative. We would continue to have impacts um, in many of these impact areas. And then in other areas, for example, biological resources with sensitive species and habitats, again, they're taking the most conservative assumption that there may be some areas where right-of-ways would need to be purchased or expanded. We don't know where there's, those will be today in a, in a citywide plan like this. The most conservative assumption we indicated, because it's speculative, that there may potentially be impacts. But again, these impacts are very limited. So, so essentially we're, we're studying what would happen if we built a city that's easier for people to walk in, but nobody else walked. It, right. Right. <laughs> right. Um, and do we also calculate for the reverse? Uh, if we fail to do anything and we keep using the, the current system we have now for mobility, uh, congestion will increase. Uh, air pollution and uh, greenhouse gases will increase. Obesity will increase. Do we have, have any counterweight for, for those environmental factors by, by failing to implement? It's certainly true that a lot of the impacts that are, exist, are proposed under the project would still exist even under a no project condition. Can you say your, your second part again? You had another question. I'm not sure quite how to... What, what the impacts would be of failing to adopt a different way of doing transportation and mobility in Los Angeles. Presumably, congestion would continue to increase. The obesity rates that we're seeing would continue to increase. Right. We wouldn't Greenhouse see... gases would go up. Exactly, and we also wouldn't see many of the benefits the plan does, which is increasing mode split, reducing vehicle trips, um, increasing the amount of people who have access to you know, these quality um, infrastructure and, op and opportunities and options. So it was explained that this process was four years in the making. Uh, exhaustive studies, public outreach, uh, there was an analysis of, of each element of the, the transit networks, the various different ones. Um, if we were to start pulling out pieces of stuff, what does that do to the underlying analysis that, that you've done? And how does it affect the integrity of the, of the entirety of the plan? Well, the, 
the, the networks really were um, analyzed as if they were a whole comprehensive network. I mean, really what we're, what we're analyzing is if we did all of these systems, and again, they're all about connectivity, regional distribution, um, so again, providing access to the, mo the largest number of people, we start pie uh, piecemealing them out and actually taking off wholesale areas of the city. We're reducing, again, kind of the benefits that the plan proposes and kind of weakens the underlying um, assumptions of, that are in the environmental document. So would we have to study, do, do additional study of any additional changes like that? Um, if we did major, we haven't, um, it would really depend on the extent of those changes. I mean, there might be some minor changes we'd be able to make that wouldn't require additional environmental. But again, if we started to do, you know, much larger um, changes, adding and subtracting, we would require to go back and do additional environmental analysis. Okay. Mr. Wiesel? Well, thank you. And uh, I, on the outreach, uh, some of the speakers raised the issue of uh, not having access to the internet, and that is their the main. It was, uh, I think, alluded that that was the main form of uh, outreach to communities. But any response to that? Or yes, I would say that, that that's not true. We certainly use the internet to supplement the kind of outreach we did because again we recognize there are a lot of um, populations especially some of our younger and our, our internet savvy populations that don't typically come out to public meetings and community forums but they are using the internet so we wanted to make sure we were tapping into that population but we also made sure that we were reaching out through community organizations the traditional you know community forums to make sure we were reaching the wide range of folks who are not necessarily participating on the internet okay. and it's an issue that I think um, I have brought up to other departments or any time the city needs to do our reaches that it is becoming um, an easier way for us to uh, do our reach whether it's through social media or through the internet uh, and broader platforms but um, we got to acknowledge that not everyone has access to those forums and so we've got to just be alert uh, acknowledge that and um, find different forms of tapping into or reaching out to some populations who don't necessarily have access to the internet. So I just want to raise that point. I, any other questions? Or, Ms., Mr. Harris Dawson. So following up on the questions about outreach, I think this is a, an amazing plan and it's very nice to come on to council when the city is undertaking such uh, dramatic and I think forward thinking, uh, but also big and grisly uh, moves forward. Uh, I'm a big fan of if you're going to make a mistake, make a mistake leaning forward. So uh, this is exciting to me. I have a follow-up question about outreach, though, uh, with particularities to the 8th Council District, but I think this probably applies to the city more broadly. So as we've watched this uh, process develop, so we hear a lot from cyclists, right? And we hear a lot from people who choose to not have a car, and then we hear a lot from the people who are automobile dependent or sort of, you know, we sort of cling to car culture. Uh, what a big population in, in South LA is, is people who are transit dependent. So if they could have a car, they would, uh, but they can't, so they don't. And I just wonder uh, what, what, and they're not very likely to come to a community meeting, because that's another bus ride that you got to take that you wouldn't necessarily choose to do. So I'm wondering, is there any market research or, you know, sort of interviewing or polling people on buses or at bus stops? Um, because that's the part of the population I feel like this is going to have the biggest impact on, but their sort of uh, voice doesn't come out so uh, in such an articulate way in what I'm hearing so far. I mean, I think we certainly took into consideration, you know, the needs of, of transit riders throughout this effort. We had the Bus Riders Union um, as part of our task force to make sure we were tapping into kind of the, the membership that they have and the kind of the outreach that they do. We also worked with a lot of organizations, some who spoke here today, um, the, the, California, the community health councils and Trust South LA, who again do outreach into those communities. Um, so we probably, there's, and I would just say that going forward, there's going to be lots of opportunity through the implementation, which, which will be much more kind of geographically focused, to do more outreach to continue to make sure that we're reaching out to those populations and we can do that a little bit more um, focus and in, in, in reach some more of those populations when we're doing a, small, a smaller effort. Mr. Fuentes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let me begin by thanking both of our chairmen for all of the hard work and staff. I, I got to tell you that I'm very, very excited about what is happening today. And so I, I wanted to just speak a little bit about implementation, but I, I wanted to sort of set a little bit of a context. Um, 
you know, it, it's no secret that the city of Los Angeles, 70% of its budget goes towards public safety. So about 30% or so is left for every other element of service delivery, whether it's sidewalks, whether it's trees, whether it's roads. Almost all of that 30% is spent in the public right away. And but for the fact that we need critical responses, think for a second if we spent 70% of our budget in the public right of way and 30% on public safety. I think it would speak, and it's not to say that I, I have an issue with law enforcement or first responders, it's to say that we could build a healthier city if we invested more in our infrastructure. I think if we had a walkable city, one that is friendly to cars and bicycles and pedestrians alike, I think we can solve a lot of our challenges. And so I just wonder out loud, and, and disproportionately today that 30% is spent to facilitate traffic and moving cars. And so I wonder out loud, what does, from your perspective, the implementation of this plan look like? I, I know that it's a largely a policy point of view and a change of view, but what does implementation look like? Is this going to happen tomorrow? Will it be ingrained in our budget? I mean, how do we get from here to there, assuming that it were to pass? So uh, I'll take a shot at that uh, as one of the uh, agencies responsible for implementation in the city and say a couple of things. First, the city has a $250 million backlog of grant-funded projects, infrastructure projects, promises we've already made to communities that we have to deliver on and we have to make good on. Um, after that sort of bucket of work, um, the Department of Transportation is going to have a keen focus on Vision Zero, and that's a plan to get to zero traffic deaths in 10 years. And that plan will articulate, have a prioritized list of safety projects, um, focusing on things that are quick and efficient to implement and provide the highest return on investment. And there will definitely be a price tag on that. Um, it's about 450 miles of our 7,500 mile network that we want to focus on. And then beyond that, when we start to think about implementation and we go from the citywide level down to the neighborhood level, um, we need to uh, take advantage of opportunities like the one presented now in the special session of the legislature to really bring dollars for local streets and roads to cities uh, where they can have local control. Uh, where dollars come directly to us so that we can go out into a community and truly say without having had to apply to a grant for a specific project and then go out to the community, we can truly say we're here with dollars. City's going to invest $30 million a year into our sidewalks. We know that. We're going to continue to resurface 2,400 lane miles um, of our network. We know that. If we were able to have a flexible pot of funding to go into communities and say these are your streets, these are your public spaces, Spaces. This is a guiding document that gives us ideas, but let's partner together in talking about the improvements that you want. We would be able to approach our streets um, in, a, in a really a fundamentally transformative way. So I think that we're going to have to balance implementation priorities. Um, Certainly the Department of Transportation will be taking this into account as we put together and think about our budget for the coming year um, and focus our requests around Vision Zero, Complete Streets, and the Mobility Plan. Um, but until we have a truly flexible source of funding, um, we're, going to be con we're going to be stuck in this same sort of um, circling the drain and trying to uh, cherry pick, uh, pick winners and losers. Um, and, and having a more of a top-down approach. Um, the second opportunity I mentioned for implementation is really through the re reauthorization of Measure R. So this plan is essential in um, identifying priorities and allowing us to identify programs that we want those dollars to flow to cities for, and then being able to go neighborhood by neighborhood um, and have uh, and show up with, with really an open mind and let the neighborhood drive those outcomes. We've already modeled that with our People Street program, the Great Streets Challenge grants, and I'd love to see us scale it up and, and have real money on the table. I would just add from the uh, Department of City Planning's perspective with respect to implementation, first of all, Measure R uh, with its local return dollars presents us uh, opportunities for implementation of many of the uh, concepts that are in this plan and having the plan and having integrated networks positions us very well uh, to uh, compete for, for funds and to uh, implement uh, some of these strategies as funding becomes available. In addition, as Claire indicated in our opening staff report, 
we in the Department of City Planning will actually have staff available on our policy side of the department to assist with implementation, and that is fairly unusual. Often we pass long-range vision plans, and uh, not to say they, they sit on a shelf, but we don't have staff available to continue that kind of laser focus on implementation, and we will have a team available to work hand-in-hand -hand with LADOT on implementation um, over the next, uh, over the coming years, and we're very pleased that we'll have those resources to continue to do outreach on a more focused project-by-project -project basis in many of your districts. The, uh, the other thing that I wanted you all to address a little bit is um, there was a, a lot of comment, I think, about the concern, and, and, and I hate to simplify it, but it seems that a lot of folks sort of see this bikes versus cars, and I, and I think it's really shortchanging the conversation. There's a lot of conversation here about the neighborhood en enhancement networks, pedestrian uh, uh, safety, the opportunity really to get people into the public right-of-way, in the public space, and ideally uh, uh, be able to enjoy it in a way that provides safety. And, and I want to thank you for prioritizing safety as sort of the guiding light to this document. But tell me a little bit about sort of what it is that you think uh, uh, can, can happen sort of going forward in terms of making sure that we're aligning this part of the general plan with the rest of it. I, I asked this to the planning uh, staff when we were together briefing on this, but I, I wanted to get your uh, thoughts a little bit, Salita, on this because there's a bit of a chicken and an egg here. It seems to me that the mobility part of the seven mandated elements in a general plan seems to be the one that is the most obvious to us from a, a fiscal perspective, at least t to me it does. Uh, housing, when you hear about the homelessness crisis, sustainability, I mean, uh, they're all really important. But this one seems to be the thread that ties together every element of a successful general plan. And then we've gone a little bit further and have added other elements like health and, and that sort of thing that I think, again, tie right back into the mobility. So how is it that we synchronize this with the other elements that either are a little bit old or need some revamping? How do you cue that as we're sort of developing our citywide budgets, uh, incentivizing uh, the production of housing where it makes sense according to this? How are we going to synchronize all of this with this plan if it were to go forward? Sure, that's such an easy question. I'll just go <laughs> ahead and answer it in 30 seconds. Um, First, I want to point out something that you alluded to, which is that um, when we talk about fixing traffic or we talk about congestion, the transportation system bears the burden of policy failures in other areas. You know, we have traffic because we have a lack of uniform excellence in the public school system. And so parents have to move to good school districts and they trade on a longer commute because their child's education is worth that trade off. We have traffic because affordable housing and low wage jobs are nowhere near each other and they're often in an, the opposite direction of the commute. Um, when we talk about living wage, we talk about affordable housing, we talk about great public schools, we're talking about transportation. And that is truly why uh, the mobility element does, is that foundational piece um, that brings, uh, that all, everything has to come together and everything, you see the results of your success or failure on the streets in those other sections. Um, when I think about how we will synchronize them and I think about the system as a whole, I think first we must make the system safe and comfortable and organized for the people who are using it today where they are using it today. Um, when we have a lot of people biking on a particular street and we don't have an organized place for them to bike, it creates more congestion because they're forced to take the lane, they create traffic, there's chaos, it's not comfortable for drivers. Drivers need predictability and people on bikes need legitimacy. And so when we don't provide that for either party, we create a disorganized system. So first, make it safe and make it work for the way people are using it now. And then we have an obligation to set the table for how we want people to get around town. And maybe not necessarily how they're getting around town today. And so that means um, creating a connected system, a walkable, transitable, bikeable system uh, around dense development and transit stations so that people can self-select who want to live a car-free or car-light lifestyle. The millennials as a cohort are now bigger than the boomers. And when you give them the choice between a car and a smartphone, they choose a smartphone because they consider driving a distraction to texting. 
So, you know, we have got to set the table for, to, to capture that and also the, for the way we want people to use the system, maybe not how they use the system today. So I think, you know, that's, that's not a, that's a little bit of an abstract answer to your question, but I would say that's the way I think about it, is that first of all, it's the foundation for success in these other places. Second of all, first, we have to make it work for the way people use it today. And third of all, we have to set the table for how we want people to use it in the future. You know, I, I, uh, I'm reminded by uh, the, the book that uh, Dr. Ed Glazer wrote uh, called Triumph of the City. And it really, I think, depicts uh, very clearly how it is that cities are going to continue to grow. They're going to continue to draw people in. And it really begs the need for all of us as policymakers to have to really understand how it is that we're going to plan for all of that. And I think the report that you all worked on describing the general plan as really the constitution to this city, I think is really spot on. I mean, we all know that inherently. But the idea that we're going to have to figure out how to develop and continue to be the triumph that the city of Los Angeles will and will continue to be is, is the hard part. And I think it's just amazing to me that, you know, just less than 100 years ago, Henry Ford spoke about vehicles as the answer to the ills of a city, to drive away from a city. And now we're looking at vehicles in some ways as one of the ills to the city of Los Angeles. And so the multimodal approach that you all are speaking to here today, I think, is long overdue. It's critical. And uh, I would, chairmen, uh, suggest that uh, we proceed with this as soon as possible in its current form and, and not uh, do any changes to it. Congratulations on the job well done. I, I very much enjoyed reading all of this, believe it or not. Uh, and it's exciting to sort of see where where it is that we're going to be in 2035. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Bonin, uh, I'll turn it back over to the T committee now for your members on any questions or comments. Yeah, sure. Mr. Englander didn't have anything on your committee? That's good. Okay. Uh, so uh, we'll go to members of the, the uh, Transportation Committee now just to sort of uh, cue things up a bit because we have the letter from um, uh, Mr. Cedillo. Uh, there are members of the council who are not on this committee, and I know that there's members of the committee uh, of the committees who are interested in some some tweaks or modifications in their in their districts. Uh, because this is a, a network plan, and because it was so comprehensively put together, uh, and it would take some time to do any changes and properly study them, uh, it's going to be the recommendation of both me and and the, the chair of Plum, Mr. Weizar, that we. Uh, approve the item as is today, and send any oh, and, and, and send any uh, uh, amending motions or potential amendments or changes, um, uh, large or small, to the the Plum and Transportation Committee, so we can thoroughly vet them and actually get the analysis. And if you're going to be doing a change, figure out what the alternative is and stuff like that. So, Mr. Rue, Mr. Kretz. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'd also. Uh, uh, commend our two chairs for their good work and staff. This is really a remarkable process. Now, I'll just focus on the one issue just because it happens to be in my district and has generated a lot of the conversation, uh, which is uh, Westwood Boulevard. And uh, first I should note, since uh, I've been painted among cyclists as an anti-cyclist person, I should point out that I'm an occasional but enthusiastic cyclist. Um, I'm probably one of the few in the room that uh, uh, has taken uh, a ride on a good chunk of the state of California when I was the first elected official to do the California AIDS ride. Um, years ago when I was on the West Hollywood City Council, I led the effort and cast the deciding vote to put in bike lanes on Santa Monica Boulevard, which otherwise wouldn't have happened. And I helped Bill Rosendahl in his efforts to finally fund bike lanes in the city of Los Angeles. So I'm not unenthusiastic uh, as a cyclist, but I think enthusiastic cyclists can also be enthusiastic realists. And that's why I strongly agree with the overwhelming preponderance of residents and community groups in Westwood uh, asking that the section of Westwood Boulevard from LeConte and Wellworth should be removed from the plan. I think we all agree on the value of having a smartly selected bike path route that supplies the missing north-south link from Westwood to Westwood Village and UCLA. But that just means we should be focused on finding and selecting the best choice 
and not just blindly pursuing a poor one. Uh, the people in this community are avid realists because they base their views on actual daily experience and firsthand observation regarding traffic flow and traffic safety. And for that very reason, they have overriding concerns about the negative impacts that bike lanes could have on Westwood Village. If that section were to remain in the plan, the village will lose crucially necessary parking and turn lanes. Traffic will be obstructed and safety will be risked, in particular because so many Santa Monica big blue buses and other buses travel through that section and that they'll cross paths with cyclists when the buses pull over. I'm also concerned about potential emergency vehicle response time delays. And so for the quality of life for that part of Westwood Village, the safety of those who travel to it and through it, and the safety of those who live near it, I believe that section should be removed from the plan. These same concerns about traffic obstruction and emergency access were recognized by the final EIR, which concluded that the plan will have unavoidable significant adverse impacts on transportation, including circulation, neighborhood intrusion, congestion management, and emergency access and a significant and unavoidable impact to fire response times. Um, I think that is a perfect description of what will happen on Westwood Boulevard. It already barely accommodates 900 plus buses, more than 25,000 cars a day, and it's so narrow that it can't meet the MTA safety standard of at least 16 and a half feet for a shared bus bike lane. The so-called benefits listed in the proposed statement of overriding, overriding considerations are speculative at best, based on unsupported wishful thinking, or flat out are denied by the final EIR itself. On the other hand, the expected negative impacts are clearly so serious and so pervasive as to endanger life and potentially paralyze the area, which I believe is why the community has spoken up so significantly, particularly in contacting my office. Uh, we do, however, very much want bicyclists to be able to access UCLA. And that's why I've consistently mentioned for serious consideration the use of other streets like Gailey Avenue. And so my office will continue to work to find alternative routes that will be safer and less disruptive than Westwood. Um, I think that there's no question there are a lot of accidents on Westwood uh, because that street is not suited for cyclists. So I think we can do better uh, and we can find a better location. Um, and uh, that's why I would like to remove this. Uh, I think it's an obvious choice. It's an obvious choice for everyone that I've heard of, and, and heard from in my community. Um, and I'd like to see us uh, remove Westwood as the only north-south choice um, in the mobility plan. If there was a way to replace it by calling out a, a general north-south route to Westwood, um, and to uh, uh, seek to make a choice and not just say Westwood Boulevard, the most dangerous choice as the, the only choice we're considering, um, I would be much happier with that if we could study all potential routes and pick the best one. Um, I think that would be uh, the better route to go. I want to first thank the two chairs, as well as my colleagues, the departments, um, the various community members who have worked on this for over four years. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very forward-looking plan. I mean, I have to admit, I remember when I turned 16, the first thing I could think about was getting my driver's license. But the funny thing today is I have some high school interns in my office, and when I found out that um, he just turned 16, I asked him when he's going to get his car, and he told me he chose not to get a car, that he was going to wait a couple more years uh, because he likes taking the train and the subway, um, which was, uh, I guess I'm getting old because <laughs> I couldn't understand that. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, and like I said, you know, I, I am coming in at the tail end. Uh, myself and Councilmember um, Harris Dawson has been in here for a little less than a month now. And... Um, and I am wanting to um, have some more time to evaluate. Um, and not just myself, but um, uh, like Councilmember Koretz, I do 
have a responsibility to my constituency and we have received, my office has received numerous um, concerns from constituents uh, ranging from increased congestion, impacts on emergency response times, uh, neighborhood intrusion of cut through traffic, all the way to impacts on habitats and wetlands. Um, so I do know that um, uh, speaking with um, uh, the departments and whatnot, is there a deadline that we need to pass this? Or no, there's no no specific deadline. However, uh, obviously, our recommendation is to move forward uh, and to position ourselves to be able to proceed with implementation. Although there is a, um, we have to add, the council has to act within 75 days of the sure. planning commission acting, which means that if we don't act before August 21st, the plan is considered denied. So, um, I mean, I, like I said, I don't want to come in at the tail end and um, deny all the great work that's been done. So, I mean, as the uh, chair, um, my transportation chair has um, stated, um, I am um, agreeable to passing the mobility plan today with the assurance that um, future amendments and tweaks uh, can be introduced to the plan because I will be working with uh, members of my community um, in my district to review and see, um, review the plan to see if there's any other alternatives. So I just want to have a reassurance that we uh, have by the, what would be the drop dead deadline? Well, uh, for the, the council needs to act by the 21st. I believe this is calendared for council next week. Uh, so the, the suggestion for me and Mr. Weezar is that we would approve the plan as is, uh, have it calendared for council next week, but then we could uh, accept either in council uh, next week or really at any time motions that could then, amending motions or, or changes or modifications to be made or to be studied that could go to the, the Plum and the Transportation Committee. Uh, obviously, the sooner they're submitted, the, the sooner they can be uh, considered. Um, the other thing, of course, is that uh, as many have, have indicated, this is really the conceptual part of the plan and that this doesn't give project approval for anything. So even if uh, you didn't do an amendment, there's still an opportunity to, to, to make changes before it gets to a project level. So it will be before um, council meeting? Yes. Mr. Kretz. <clears throat> Entirely clear on this. So um, when would we actually take the amendments? Would we submit them at the meeting where this comes before the city council? We could submit them, but our recommendation would be that those, the, the, the amendments not be voted on at the same time as the mobility plan, that we approve the mobility plan in its entirety in council, sort of as we did with the, the gun magazine issue this week where we approved it last week and then we voted on subsequent amendments later or as we're continuing to vote on subsequent amendments. Uh, because a number of the proposals, uh, some of them are small, uh, some of them are substantive uh, and would require some study, which would certainly take longer than the, the, the few remaining days we have before the 21st. But we'd expect all these amendments to be heard and voted on before we took a next step that was more final on, on this mobility plan. Before we took anything, any steps to implement the mobility plan, absolutely. Yeah. And, and maybe just to give some comfort to the, the councilman's question, we can just maybe just speak briefly about, you know, Westwood Boulevard, for example, in that and I think I alluded to this in my earlier remarks, when the plan really describes the networks, you know, they're part of our implementation strategy. So we're not designating these streets as being on a particular network. We are recommending, again, that we have this comprehensive approach to going out and funding things and, and, and the way we look at it and to implement it. But we also have to do additional environmental review. We have to do additional design. There's been a lot of numbers that have been thrown about today about what Westwood Boulevard might look like if it had a protected bicycle lane. We really don't know exactly what that would look like, especially in the fact that it does have a lot of transit. We also have it actually on our transit enhanced networks. We recognize the very important value Westwood um, plays in transit connectivity. But we also know that it is really important to, one of the reasons we, we want to leave it on the plan you know, for now in terms of, again, having this as a guiding document, is it tells us that that north-south connection between 
the university and the rest of the city is, is very important. But it doesn't preclude us from, again, in those additional conversations that we would have going forward when we're talking with the community and doing digital environmental and doing different design development, to look at the kind of different alternatives that the councilman spoke of today. So I just wanted to kind of give you that, that comfort and assurance. The, the other analogous legislative action that this body recently took was in voting for the minimum wage. We voted for the, the, the bulk of the legislation, uh, but then uh, put the amendments, such as the tipped wages and stuff like that, on a, on a track for separate considerations. This one, obviously, more time sensitive than the, the living wage, which didn't have a time deadline on it. Well, I just want to be sure that we we have that opportunity before we start implementing, because I believe even though it's not etched in stone, if Westwood is the street that's called out, Westwood's the street where this is going to be built on, whether it's a good idea or not. So I want to be sure we have the opportunity to explore alternatives before we move forward with that. I, yeah, I, I think it would be unprecedented for uh, the department to go out not in partnership with the council office and start putting stripes on the street and building things. We wouldn't do that. Um, and I also think this is a 20-year plan. So you, you want to think about the way Westwood looks today is maybe not the way it's going to look even five years from now, ten years from now. There are technologies and other modes that are going to come online that we, can't pre we cannot predict necessarily today what it will look like. And so we do want to take a look at all of the options that are available um, when we start thinking about going out to implement. Yeah, I, I would, if I could point out though, because it is a 20-year plan, um, I'm representing my constituents right now, and 10 years from now when this is done, I won't be on the council, but it, it may proceed because I wasn't a good steward uh, of, of the wishes of this district and the needs of it. So I definitely want to be sure that we cover this and cover it early before we move very far forward. Mr. Brew? Yeah, and I just want to reconfirm as well. I just want to reconfirm as well. Um, I will be probably introducing some amendments as well, like uh, Councilman Paul Koretz, but however, um, the, like, uh, so this is just the plan. Doesn't mean, and obviously like something like 4th Street, which I had concerns about, there would have to be some more studies done about how, even where the uh, bike lane would even be. I, I can't even picture it in my head where it would be. So, and on top of that, there is, I'm assuming there's no funding attached to any of this plan, right? So if there was funding, you would probably come back to the, council, to the city council as well as the council office to, um, to get our buy-in, and we could probably have another discussion at that time. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes, that's correct. I also wanted to just assure you that the plan for Fourth Street, and again, would have to be further studied, but it's on our neighborhood enhanced network, so it's not anticipating putting in a bicycle lane. It's really looking at street calming measures that would make it more comfortable for bicyclists and also actually would help reduce um, cut through traffic into the area because, again, you'd be slowing down um, the vehicle experience and also then making it safer for pedestrians. So there will be a lot more time for community input, again, and uh, discussion. Absolutely. That's critical to our process. Okay. Yeah, there's a huge delta between a citywide network and an actual implementation project in terms of the conversation and technical analysis, further traffic analysis, further community outreach to um, Councilmember Harris Dawson's comment. You know, that's where the rubber hits the road. But we have to make sure that we hear from and speak with people where they are. We meet them where they are um, and not expect them to come out to talk about a citywide plan, which is a tough sell for folks. So I think that um, that's really where the partnership between planning and DOT comes into play, um, and we, we're constantly working on improving that process. Harris Dawson? So I think I probably have the opposite concerns of uh, Mr. Yu and, and Mr. Koretz, uh, and the motion that I distributed to, to members of both committees, and, and I, I agree with the chairs, we'll hold it and do it in the, the order that they suggest. But this is a 20-year plan, uh, none of it's funded, so the question becomes what gets what gets prioritized? How is equity monitored, especially over a 20-year period? Uh, and how is it not like a lot of other things that happen in the city that, in fact, produce the need for this plan? I mean, the reason why Westwood Boulevard is so crowded is because I think it has three uh, grocery stores on it. My district, a grocery store hasn't been built in 25 years. 
Uh, so people drive there to go to the grocery store and make more traffic. And so in order to not repeat the unevenness, I want to put something forward around, around equity. And I just wanted to hear from you. Uh, what's your sense of how you all can make sense of something like that in terms of the implementation? One of the, um, the key things in this plan, because we, we wholeheartedly you know, support what you're talking about, is that we've created a data-driven process for prioritizing projects. And we think that going forward, it's going to be critical for us to, to use data to make decisions about where we, where we put our dollars. And to that um, point, we have a policy that says we should make the most of limited financial resources by utilizing data to prioritize transportation projects based upon safety, public health, equity, access, vulnerable social characteristics, social benefits, and or economic benefits. We keep it fairly broad only because we also know that with different funding sources, there's going to be different priorities. We also um, chose not to mention a specific data source in here because, again, we know over the 20 years there will be data sources today or they're in place in the future we don't even know about today. So we didn't want to get that specific. But we think this covers the kind of the range of the issues and ensures that we as a city are looking to these kinds of data sources when we're making decisions about where we're going to put um, our funding. One of the other things in the programs in this plan, we're committing as a department to come back on an annual basis and provide you an, with a report in terms of how we're doing. And that also provides the council with an opportunity to continue to hold our feet to the fire and to continue to press your objectives and how we implement this plan. So, so your data inputs are not static? That's correct. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Fuentes? Thank you, Mr. Chair. On, on Mr. Harris Dawson's point, uh, I, I asked a little while ago, how is it that you synchronize this with everything else? And Mr. Harris Dawson, you know, I, I have the same concern that you do. I, I want to figure out how to get more sooner. In my community, uh, I've actually lost two supermarkets. And so my hope is that this plan gives me the ability, along with community plan updates, along with trying to figure out some other additional incentives uh, to attract more capital, that I will then be able to go to uh, a, a supermarket or another economic development opportunity and say, we've got it all here for you. We've got the infrastructure on its way. We've got some uh, money available uh, through the old CRA. We've got a community plan update. I think it's that synergy that will help drive traffic, rather, help drive uh, the selection uh, process in a way where the projects that will reap the, more bene the most benefits will, will move sooner. But I, I share the same concern that, that you've got and would like for us to sort of, if there's a way for us to memorialize that at some point so that we do look at parts of the city of Los Angeles that historically have not had the investment, um, which is why Measure R is such an amazing, important thing for all of us. And this is my plug for the COGS. The Council of Governments process is also incredibly important because it's going to begin to queue projects, and it's all a matter of getting everything in place, I think, so that we can actually attract the capital, the investment, and the welcome uh, environment. So uh, if there's a way to prioritize that, that would be fantastic. But I, I do think this is such a key component to making it so that we can right the wrongs of poor planning and lack of investment in communities like the one that I represent. I was just going to say. And, and I, sh I should note that this also puts us in much better stead in applying for active transportation funds. Uh, I would presume it also puts us in, in better position to apply for cap and trade funds as well, uh, which are specifically designated for, uh, for, for communities that are underrepresented and underserved. That's correct. It's a different form of uh, being shovel ready. You're not necessarily shovel ready, but at least we're showing whether it's a grant, state, federal, or otherwise, that we have a concept in place and this is the direction we're going rather than coming up from scratch uh, right now and as opposed to going to ad hoc from different projects that come up throughout the city. We kind of have this uh, uh, guide plan in place. Um, and with that, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I'd like to ask uh, on our end if there's any further questions or comments. Um, otherwise, I'd uh, love to um, uh, at least uh, make a motion uh, for the Plum Committee that we approve the mobility plan as is. Uh, we have um, some amendments from uh, our uh, some members in the Plum Committee. Uh, one of them is from uh, Mr. Cedillo, uh, which we will um, ask that we refer these to or 
refer it to a future uh, planning and transportation committee. Uh, I also have uh, a number of amendments that actually asks to add um, some streets to the network. Um, it's an extensive list, um, but we will uh, uh, take those up amendments as well to the uh, joint to a future joint committee. And Mr. Harris Dawson, you had a motion as well. Um, yes, I wanted to uh, approve the mo uh, the mobility plan and the technical amendments made by the planning department. But I'd also like to. Uh, propose that the plan be amended to make sure it include affirmatively, affirmative, affirmatively states that equity is an important factor in prioritizing projects for implementation. We, we will take that along with our motion and, and not defer that for a future meeting, um, as well as uh, if we could also recommend and instruct the Department of Planning and uh, Transportation that any uh, mo the, that the mobility plan to list the council alongside the mayor's office as an implementing agency as well, uh, that's been omitted uh, from some documents. We could include the council as well. Uh, so those two actual amendments, but the amendments by myself and Mr. Suggested amendments by Cedillo will take up at a future date. Second by Mr. Mr. Fuentes. Uh, as always, what it sucks up. So I'm kind of stating a, a motion for the Plum Committee. I understand, or I was informed, we need to take separate okay. actions. So this is for the Plum Committee. I'll make the same recommendation. Yes. The when you said, excuse me, when you said approve the plan as amended to include the department's uh, amendments, or are you saying the department's amendments go with the committee? No, no. Amendments? Include the uh, uh, the department's amendments. Oh, so, so you want to approve the plan as amended with the uh, Planning's amendments yes. and then refer. Okay, I just wanted That's to clarify. Right. Uh, and and we're also amending it to include Mr. Harris Dawson's suggested suggestion language on equity, uh, my language on including the council as a uh, implementing agency as well, along with the mayor's office. But the circulating, we'll get, the circulating um, amendments by myself and Mr. Cedillo will take up at a future future date. And so, at least for the Plum Committee, any objection to that? Uh, so ordered. Thank you. The clerk, get that? Uh, that was kind of confusing, huh? Okay. okay, so for the purposes of at least the Plum Committee's recommendation going forward, approve the plan as with departmental amendments. Um, additionally, include the um, equity um, amendment. And finally, include the um, amendment in regard to designating councils an implementing body in addition to the office of the mayor. So yes. Uh -huh. And, okay. There were some, case, there uh, some circulating amendments by Councilmember Cedillo and some from Council District 14. Those two will be taken up at a future date. Okay. That will okay. be handled separately. Then yes, Mr. Brett. A unanimous a vote, uh, then a unanimous vote for, on Plum's part on that. Piece. One second before we announce the vote. Yes, Mr. Uh, is there any reason why you're not including my motion to? I'm sorry, I was just taking Westwood. up the Plum uh, members' amendments, but we could take yours up as well. I'm sorry, I would uh, Mr. Chris. Yeah, you're correct. Uh, in my mind, I was thinking just Plum members, but you're right. We should take yours I mean, up this as is a well. a joint meeting, so yeah. presumably okay. we're voting on everything that's been yeah. Put I'm sorry about forward. that. Yeah, and we'll uh, Sedil's, Weezars, and Coret's amendments will take about a future date. Okay. And, and ju just to note, to be clear, Mr. Rue has the opportunity no, to, to submit motions yeah. as well yeah. at, at council. That's correct. Um, those particular pieces will not be mentioned in the committee report since it's being handled separately. Right. And obviously, at some point, motions and or reports will be submitted yes. and they'll be considered. But the chairs <coughs> are stating their intention on. to handle them the same way. Okay. Um, in that case, um, that being a situation, we appears that we have a unanimous, uh, at least of all the committee members of Plum, Agree with this? Um, yeah. Shall I? Yes. Read so one? ordered. Yes. yes. Okay. That would be um, Councilmember Jose Wizar, Councilmember Marquise Harris Dawson, uh, Councilmember Mitchell Englander, and uh, Councilmember Felipe Fuentes. Um, all vote yes. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. In the case of transportation, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I'll, I'll uh, to make things easy. I'll make the same uh, recommendation for transportation committee. I, something tells me that Mr. Wizar is probably inclined to second it. <laughs> uh, could you restate the motion just so I can make sure everything's included? Uh, let, me, let me see if I can restate it. 
the restated motion is to uh, approve the uh, recommendations from the planning and uh, transportation departments today with the mobility plan and the department's uh, recommended technical amendments uh, to include with that uh, Mr. Harris Dawson's motion on uh, equity uh, and uh, to also include the instruction that the City Council be given equal status as an implementing agency to the Mayor's office uh, and to refer the other motions uh, including Mr. Wiesars, Mr. Cedillo's and yours, Mr. Koretz, is uh, to uh, both the uh, Plum and Transportation Committees. Did I get that right? Yes. All right. And for the record, uh, voting yes for transportation, that would be Councilmember Bonin, Councilmember Koretz, Councilmember Wizard, and Councilmember Rue. Do I have that correct? Yes. Thank you. It's a lot yeah. easier when there's just one, one committee here, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> All's in order here. All set, Mr. Clerk? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. So, seeing no other items on the agenda, at least for Plum, meeting is adjourned. I assume it's the same for the Transportation Committee, correct? Right? <laughs> we too are adjourned. <laughs>